Okay, I think we're officially live. Um, that took a while. I'm sorry for that. Um, we're still rather experimental. Welcome to Canvas and Currents, uh, a program by the Porpoise Conservation Society with a special hello to our friends from the Marine Mammal Rescue Community. This is a program where you can see live art in action with my friend and colleague Julius Chetney who is an award-winning artist, uh, has been published everywhere. He's, he's uh, done books. His artwork appears in uh, the Smithsonian uh, Museum. Where else have you been, Julius? Oh, um, it's been, I think there are over between 30 and 40 museums worldwide and then lots of books, publications uh, by uh, various uh, scientists, uh, the Royal Canadian Mint, so close to 40, 40 Outlets. now, I think. Oh, wow. And then like a bunch of uh, Canada Post stamps as well. So it's been always it's been <laughs> a very interesting kind of uh, uh, adventure. Julius is all over the place. And we are extremely fortunate to have him here today to talk about Dal's Porpoise, an incredible species that we've been going on about for yeah. the last half an hour or so as we were setting yeah, up. They're fascinating. They're, they're amazing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, so I'm Julius, um, and Marcus and I uh, are really having a lot of fun with these uh, Canvas and Currents uh, broadcasts, and so we're hoping to make this a nice regular thing. And so this is episode two now, and we're going to be featuring Dallas Porpoise. Um, so we're coming here from the um, the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, people's um, land where I live, and I, I think that might also be the same here, if I'm not mistaken. I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we like to um, you know, acknowledge um, the, the actual uh, um, inhabitants of the land uh, and we really would like to push for uh, uh, far better reconciliation with First Nations than we currently have. But in the meantime, um, let's talk about some of the wonderful animals that we have here in these amazing lands and in particular in this case uh, in the water next to the lands. And so um, the Dal's porpoise uh, absolutely fascinating organism. Uh, this uh, the scientific name is uh, Phocinoides uh, dalii. And um, little little intro about the where the words come from. Actually, uh, Marcus, do you know where the word porpoise comes from? Since we're talking about porpoises. No, actually, I don't. <laughs> so it's it comes from a, a combination of uh, uh, I think in the Latin uh, porcus um, piscus, which means literally pigfish. <laughs> so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, in German, it, it's uh, it, it, all all porpoises. They're called Schweinswale, which literally oh, means sense. pigs, whales, right? Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, they kind of look they kind of look little, little little porky. They're they're really cute. They're adorable cetaceans. They're they're little short, chunky ones compared to some of the more um, well-known dolphins and, and a lot of the longer-bodied whales. Uh, so these are a lot more short and squat. We talked about the vaquita in detail on the International Save the Vaquita Day um, just uh, in, that was in August, wasn't it? And uh, Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that was the smallest one, actually. Now, today, we're going to be dealing with the biggest porpoise, uh, the Dallas porpoise, which can grow over, I think it's 400 kilograms um, it, it's huge. It can grow up to about two and a half meters long, and um, it can live up to up to even twenty two years. Although most in the wild live for less than that, more like fifteen or so, I guess. Um, but uh, you know, they're an amazing animal. Um, they are the absolute speedsters of the waters. They are, I think, the fastest swimming cetacean known, up to something like fifty five kilometers per hour. Do we do we do we want to show them a picture? Because I've I've oh, got yeah. people actually asking yeah, like what what is a what is yeah. a Dal's porpoise? Because I I, yeah, right. I understand most people have no idea what a porpoise is, which mm -hmm. is part of why the Porpoise Let's Conservation that, Society actually. exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, uh, let me, sorry, you know what? I I have to. Yeah. In the meantime, we can we can chat about them. Uh, I'm gonna pull it up in the meantime here. But yeah, um, Dal's porpoise are the only, as far as I know, the only porpoise uh, among the, what is it now, seven species are recognized, I think, is it? Uh, yeah, there is there is some talk about uh, at some point making, making that eight, right. I think, because the, 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 finless, the finless porpoise, yeah, they're, they're still trying to figure out whether that mm -hmm. might be, a, the Yangtze finless porpoise might be a separate species. Yeah, that's actually really interesting, isn't it? Um, sorry, I'm just having a... 
a a a, a brain fart day. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So, oh, that's not actually what I wanted. Oh, let me just pull this up. I I, I made actually. Um, yeah, let's just do it this way. I created a a um, a graphic showing um, several of the porpoise species. Actually, I think all of the porpoise species. Um, and it is incredibly difficult to find the graphic, which I w <laughs> had pulled up earlier, but then I lost it. <laughs> so when I do find it, uh, I'm going to I'm going to put it up here. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, um, yes. Well, I'm going to be doing artwork. Okay, I found it anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, so Dow's Porpoise, I'm just going to sh uh, share that screen actually. Uh, let's see, I'm still getting used to this uh, StreamYard. Here we go. Okay, and present. Here we go. Good. And. <laughs> We have here so many cameras here, people have no idea how know, much right? technology it yeah, takes exactly. to, to oh, make this event happen. Yeah, it's always just a few stages. Well, okay, there we go. That should should share it, I think. Um, there you go. So this is what a Dal's porpoise looks like. And um, it's a full sun. Oh, let me just click on that because we don't need the things on the There we go. Okay, now you can see the whole thing. So this is um, a very strangely shaped animal. Amazing. It is uh, not in the same genus as other porpoises, which are Phocina. Um, and Phocina actually comes from the Greek, uh, which uh, Phocina literally meant porpoise. And so it basically comes directly from that. Uh, and Phocinoides basically means uh, it's like a porpoise. So it's a similar looking organism to other porpoises like the harbor porpoise, which we also have in our waters here. Dow's porpoise is also found off the coast of BC here, but we don't see it as often as we see, for example, harbor porpoises. The things that you notice about this animal uh, are, first of all, it's beautiful tuxedo color patterns. They're just gorgeous with that stark black and white. And uh, you can see actually how it's got that, that beautiful, uh, almost like orca-like coloration. If you were here for the last, for the first episode, we were talking about orcas and how they've got this strong, striking black and white color patterns. And actually, Dallas porpoises are quite similar that way. As porpoises go, they're very starkly um, uh, contrasted. And uh, there's differences in the two major sort of subspecies. The Dowley subspecies, which is the one we see here, and the one that we have on our coasts here, on the Eastern Pacific, has the white marking on the underside going only part of the way uh, forward along the flanks. And then, well, this is actually a little bit closer to the, to the Trui type. Um, Trui is the other uh, subspecies. And the Trui type has that uh, white patch going all the way forward to the pectoral fins or the flippers uh, near the head. And so what we see normally here is, is one with a little bit less white on it than they would say on the West uh, Pacific near uh, Japan or the upper part, the south part of the Bering Sea, for example, um, in the Sea of Okhotsk. Um, there you see more of the other types. Uh, but um, there are about 11 populations of them recognized uh, and, and they're, they, travel all over the place within the eastern and western Pacific Ocean, especially in northern boreal waters. They like cooler water um, from just above freezing to maybe, what, 10, 15 degrees Celsius or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So they're definitely a northern cetacean. Definitely. And, and look, at the, look at the shape. It's hard to imagine this in three dimensions here, but the side view of it shows that it's a very deep-bodied animal. And when you consider that this is the fastest cetacean alive, it makes perfect sense. The animal's body is not just thick. Uh, it's not wide so much as, as just deep. It's, it's relatively narrow in cross-section uh, for that height. And especially in certain parts, like you look at just before the, the flippers uh, in the back there, the flukes, sorry, the, the flukes in the back, the tail, uh, flippers, you can see how it goes into this sort of almost like a second crest or a hump just before the, the flukes. And there's that first big hump 
just under the dorsal fin. That second hump there, just before the flukes, is very narrow. It's almost like a fin, almost like a separate fin. Uh, and it would help to stabilize the body during the propulsive strokes uh, and increase the hydrodynamic efficiency of, of this beautiful animal as it swims through the water. Uh, and also, you'll see there's that weird bump underneath uh, the in front of the tail, in front of the flukes. This is actually an area where it kind of flares outward a little bit on both sides. And so you have still more stabilization of the body. Basically, this is like an underwater missile, like a really advanced torpedo. It, can swim extraordinarily quickly because the way that it, it guides water around its body and reduces the amount of drag when its, uh, its muscles move around its body, uh, the water around its body is really impressive for a, a water uh, living animal. And so we can reach these speeds of about 55 kilometers per hour, and which is really spectacular. And so when, when they come to the surface, Unlike dolphins, they don't normally leap out of the water breaching, but they do skim the surface at high speed. And one of the characteristic features that you'll see to recognize them at sea is when they're swimming at high speed and they skim the surface, that funny shaped dorsal fin on top, that weird little hook like dorsal fin, um, will cut through the surface and will guide water over the top of it into a rooster tail. So basically it'll it'll generate this sort of arc of water that um, splashes out above it. And it's a very characteristic feature of fast swimming Dallas porpoises. And so you, you can see that. If you notice that any time in, in, in the water out uh, while you're, let's say, on a ferry or, or an, on, on another boat out in the uh, Strait of Georgia or somewhere, uh, then you're lucky to have probably spotted a Dallas porpoise. Uh, really neat to be able to see these. It's yeah, it's it's quite rare because they're they're a little bit of an of an uh, open ocean species more so than uh, than harbor porpoise, which we named harbor porpoise because they do hang out in, in those shallow waters. <laughs> yeah. um, these are these like deep water, and they will actually feed on a lot of deep water fish like lantern fish or some squid, um, anchovies, uh, herring, smelt, um, and and other fish like that. So they like soft bodied animals, but they're not very picky. So they do eat a lot of different kinds of smaller prey, vertebrate and invertebrate alike. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they, they often hunt deeper water animals. And sometimes they, they hunt at night when some of these deeper dwelling animals normally come to the surface. So a lot of fish have these, what are called these uh, DL cycles of, of, uh, through the water column, uh, DL referring to like daily. And so in the daytime, they'll swim in deeper water, and then at nighttime, they'll rise to the surface. This is how you see cookie cutter sharks and how you have a very, very few examples of, of cookie cutter shark bites on, on humans because they typically are deep water um, ectoparasitic sharks. Cool, we gotta cover that sometime. Uh, and they'll come to the surface at night in, in very, very deep water. And har uh, Dallas porpoise like to hang out mostly over deep waters. Uh, I think it's something like over 600 feet deep is typically what they prefer. And they, they'll hang out over that water. So we normally don't have them in the harbors like harbor porpoise. So if you see yeah. them, it's more likely out uh, over the continental shelf or at the edge of the continental shelf, things like that, where you they can actually get some deeper waters. So, are um, we are yeah. we gonna are we gonna get to the art? Let's do that. Part? I have set up. Um, so I mentioned uh, to anybody who was watching um, uh, that I was going to use a different kind of a medium this time than last time. Last time um, I used uh, colored pencils, a white colored pencil on black paper. This time we're going to break open the soft pastels uh, and on uh, blue paper. And so what we have here is a combination. I've got. Um, pastel sticks like these guys here, for example. These ones are, um, there's a couple of brands that I really like. This is Rembrandt. Uh, my favorites are Schmincke. Uh, Schmincke has the most wonderful soft pastels that I've so far used. There's a lot of different kind of nice ones, but I really love Schmincke. Uh, but you know, different colors come in different uh, types. And what we're seeing here is these are pan pastels. So they're actually super ultra soft. And they are basically like a powder that's been pressed together into these um, pans. And so, oops, oh, it's this one here. There we go. <laughs> Close up of it there. Um, it's a very, very soft powder. And what I end up doing basically is we can use these kinds of instruments, these soft 
very soft little brushes and you just kind of pick up some of it and spread it over the surface of the paper. Basically you end up painting with it, but it's pastel and it's not oil pastel. These are dry pastels, so it's not oily. Uh, and of course that presents its own challenges for after you put it on the paper, you have to be careful because it will rub off more easily than oil pastels. And so you, you will need to fix it afterwards with spray fixative, but you have to also be very careful in applying that because the moisture of the fixative can also alter the distribution of the pigment particles. So it's a, it's a very complex medium, but I really enjoy using soft pastels. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna use soft pastels to effectively paint a picture of Gauss porpoise. And the way I've got it set up here, and you can't really see it on the page now because I've drawn it very, very lightly in pencil. Um, you might see a little bit of it kind of shining. Is there will be one individual underwater and then we'll have kind of one of those broken above and underwater uh, scenes where the, the, the surface of the water is, is cut by the view. And you'll have a view above the water showing one individual swimming at high speed, uh, creating a rooster tail um, of water. And so we'll kind of see what you'll see above the water and then what we would see if we were able to say be underwater when they passed by at high speed. So fascinating. So that's what I'm gonna get started on. This is a very different process. This is actually gonna be the very first time I've used pan pastels. So we're gonna kind of try these out. And so uh, this is, uh, pastels are wonderful to work with. I actually prefer to use uh, dry pastels on velour paper. I don't know if you've ever tried that. It's like velvet, it feels like velvet texture. It's got little fibers that stick up just like velvet, but it's beautiful because it holds the pastel pigments extraordinarily well. Uh, it just feels amazing working on it. Now, I couldn't find any of that in the art store this time. I was actually surprised they didn't have it. Uh, hopefully they will next time. But I'm using uh, a very common pastel paper called Canson, and it's one of my favorites otherwise. Uh, so if you'd like to try this at home, um, you know, this is kind of the medium that I'm working with. So what I'm gonna do here is um, I'm going to start by sort of lightly outlining the porpoise underwater so that we can kind of see where we're going. Now this is a little different as you can see from some of the how to draw lessons that we did say on uh, Sierra Club BC or uh, we also did one um, on um, sea otters with the, the MMR I believe it was. Uh, we did with the Marine Mammal Rescue Committee. That's right. Yeah. Sorry yeah I'm using the, the TLAs, the three letter acronyms and that's right the Marine Mammal Rescue uh, this uh, Marine Mam Mammal Rescue... Technically, it's BC MMRS. The BC Marine Mammal Rescue <laughs> right. Society is promoting is. the Vancouver Aquarium right. Marine Mammal exactly. Rescue Center. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, oh yeah, those adorable little seals. And of course, yeah, we have sea otters in our waters. And so we had a how to draw uh, webinar uh, featuring sea otters a while back. But this is a little different. This is more like sort of like a Bob Ross kind of a style. I, I paint and then, you know, hopefully people will enjoy watching it. And, and then I'll give tips along how how to how I do this so that you can do more kinds of artwork like this with these media. Um, so that's what we're going to start with. So and if, mm -hmm. if you guys, I'm just going to interrupt you here very quickly. If you guys uh, at home, if you want to ask any questions in between oh, yes. or have any comments for us, you can leave those uh, through the chat in all those places where we're broadcasting today. Our Twitter stream died, so we're not on X or Twitter today, but maybe not a big loss. We're everywhere else. So wherever you're watching from, uh, whether you're watching uh, via the Porpoise Conservation Society or the BC Marine Mammal Rescue Society's channels, that's all good. Just leave your comments there in the chat and we'll see it and uh, we'll respond to it. And uh, bear with us as we're still trying to figure out how all these things work. I have lots of buttons in front of me with lots of different camera perspectives. We're going to try out and see uh, what works best as yes. Julius goes about uh, creating this amazing art about this incredible animal. Yeah, we're really just kind of figuring this stuff out as we go. But so far, we've been having a lot of fun with it. So I think we're going to keep doing it. <laughs> so I'm going to start actually by taking some Payne's Gray color. I really like Payne's Gray because it is a beautiful, soft kind of bluish gray, sort of a, a darkish one. And so I'm going to pick up some of that um, pigment with uh, one of these fine uh, little brushes. And I'm going to start applying a little bit of it to the edge of the animal that I have uh, outlined lightly in pencil here. Uh, so I don't know if you can actually can you see that. It's a little bit light so far. Uh, it's very light. But what I'm going to probably do is shift to a different color. I've got a darker um, gray as well, just so that we can see it more clearly, I think. So I'm going to actually shift to this color, which is a, 
This one is this one is chromium oxide green. Oh, that's interesting. It doesn't look very green to me. It looks like some kind of a gray. Anyway, it's a very dark color, uh, relatively speaking. And it should be more visible here, basically, as I apply it. And as I do, we'll start to see the shape of the animal, basically, show up. But what it's, it's amazing when, if you get a chance to use these pan pastels, please try it, because it's a really wonderful um, feeling. It, it really starts to look like, um, like an oil pastel, oil, oil painting, basically. Um, as you apply it, it's really, really soft, and you can spread it beautifully as well. So it's hard to see there, I think, a little bit. I'm gonna try something else. I'm gonna take a black um, soft pastel stick, and I'm gonna try to apply that using these, uh, using this kind of a, a technique as well. Let's see if we can get a little bit more visibility there. Okay, so that might actually work. Uh, I'm gonna pick up some of this. It's so not as soft as the, the pan pastels, but it does pick up as well. And we can at least um, start to show the overall uh, shape of it. Well, there you go. So you can start to see a little bit better there. And what I'm doing here is actually kind of the reverse of what we did last time. I started at the back end of the animal because it's actually turned towards the left in this case. So this little hump back here, this is that second hump on the animal near the tail, near the flukes. It's that part that's narrow and acts kind of like a second dorsal fin. It's really interesting. It just such an unusually shaped uh, porpoise. Porpoises in general are really fascinating shaped, and they're very diverse in their shape. Uh, some of them have, uh, and, and their dorsal fins are a really good example of how their diversity shows up as well. Dallas porpoise have this really strange forward canted or forward leaning dorsal fin, which is extraordinarily rare among cetaceans. I believe the only other cetaceans I know of that have a forward canted dorsal fin are Hawaiian spinner dolphins, uh, and only one major population of them as well, or, or some species of population, um, that sometimes have a wonderfully forward canted dorsal fin. Very, very strange, a forward swept sort of thing. And that actually has some uh, hydrodynamic and in the air for aircraft, aerodynamic uh, applications as well. So it's it's not there without reason. Um, it, it does interesting things, though I'm not an expert at the aerodynamics of that particular shape. But uh, I've seen it on experimental aircraft. Uh, for example, some of you may be familiar with the experimental aircraft called the X-29, which years and years ago was uh, developed from the, uh, the body of an F-5 Tiger. And they apply forward swept wings on it. So it's the strangest looking aircraft. And uh, it can increase the, I think, the maneuverability of the aircraft. Um, really neat kind of a situation. So these guys, these Dallas porpoise and also the Hawaiian spinner dolphins have these strange dorsal fins that are forward swept or kind of leaning forward. Not quite as much as the wings of the X-29, but very unusual for cetaceans, for whales, dolphins, and porpoises in general. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to see that, isn't it? Uh, so I'm wondering if I maybe I should try to just kind of outline it more um, obviously with the stick itself first, and let's see if we can go from there. I'm going to start drawing it a little bit with the pastel stick directly with the edge of it. And this is what's useful when you have pastel. Oh, you can see it a little bit clearer now. When you have pastels, um, you kind of have to rotate it in your hands a little bit as you use it because you're looking sometimes for a really sharp edge in certain applications. And that kind of wears off over time, especially with soft pastels, especially the really soft pastels like Schmincke or Rembrandt. Um, those ones kind of wear off pretty quickly. And so we're seeing here though, the edge is working quite well and I'm just going up the back of the animal toward that dorsal fin and into that dorsal fin here. And so now we have kind of a nice sort of a hard line um, along the back of the animal from the dorsal fin down to the the, what's called the, the caudal peduncle. It's kind of that area of the, the body just before the, the tail fin or the, the flukes in this case, and the flukes are here. And so I'm just gonna spread that out a little bit now with the And I brush. just, it, it, I'm, a, I'm a bit slow, but I found an image of the- um, Oh, there you are, yep. The X-29. It's the X-29, mm -hmm. right? Is that what That's you're looking one. for? Yes, it's, uh, exactly. 
So you can actually recognize the shape overall of the fuselage. It's very similar to um, the, um, the F5 Tiger, but uh, it was used as a, um, it was developed from that. Right. And uh, it is actually um, a very modified kind of a beast. But uh, yeah, very unusual. So you can see the forward swept wings, really interesting. Uh, so these guys don't, the Dallas Porpoise don't have as forward swept uh, dorsal fin, but it's interesting that, that the front edge is almost vertical and the trailing edge is very much uh, shallower. It's very, very different from the usual situation. And they're not hooked the same way as, as say, the um, dorsal fin of the vaquita. The vaquita the, the tiny vaquita, the smallest cetacean, the smallest porpoise, has the most dolphin-shaped um, dorsal fin. It's a very falcate or hooked dorsal fin uh, for porpoises. As I was mentioning, porpoises have amazing diversity in their dorsal fin shape. Uh, the Burmeister's porpoise has this hugely swept back dorsal fin that uh, it basically ends up pointing almost horizontally backward. <laughs> Whereas... The finless porpoises have no dorsal fin at all, or just a ridge along the top, uh, sort of like a, 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 a kind of, what would you call it, like a textured ridge. Um, and then there, the harbor porpoise has kind of like a low triangular fin. Uh, the um, spectacled porpoise has the most amazing fin in the male, it has this gigantic sort of uh, spoon-shaped uh, uh, fin, or dorsal fin. Uh, yeah, and then so the Dallas porpoise also shows what we refer to as sexual dimorphism, where males and females look slightly different from each other in this case, or radically different depending on the species. Uh, for the Dallas porpoise, the males are the ones that typically have the most highly developed, uh, most vertical of the dorsal fins and that, that big hump on the back of the animal. Uh, so that's just right under the dorsal fin. And females are a little bit more streamlined in shape and have a slightly lower dorsal fin. So what I'm drawing here, I don't know if you call it drawing or painting actually, because I'm using uh, a stick to draw, but I'm also using one of these uh, little brushy things to, to paint afterwards. So it's kind of a both drawing and painting at the same time. Uh, and I'm not ambidextrous at this scale. <laughs> I'm not actually paint drawing with one and painting with the other hand, like some crazy superhero, but, um, but at, the, that's the next, the next stage for you. Yeah, that's it. When we get to the larger easel or larger canvases, I do, I can paint with my right hand at that scale. That's that's okay. But at small scales for finer work, I got to use my left hand. But it's useful to have another hand to store things in, right? So that's what I use that for for now. Uh, so I'm just putting in the the flippers, the which are the the pectoral fins, and they are equivalent to our arms. Evolution has resulted in some marvelous uh, um, body configurations of animals and uses of certain limbs for one purpose or another purpose, depending on the environment. And so Dallas, all terrestrial animals, all land animals evolved from fish. Uh, fish were uh, aquatic and they have fins. And so they had a pair of fins, the pectoral fins uh, just behind their gills. Those, the bones in, at the bases of those fins are what evolved into our arm bones, the humerus, the radius and ulna and our wrist bones and finger bones. And then those function really well in our ancestors that were quadrupedal or walked on four feet, um, they worked really well to, to move along the ground. And then, Later ancestors took to walking upright on, on only our hind limbs and now our front legs or our, our derived uh, pectoral fins from fish have now become these uh, prehensile structures that are useful for manipulating things like um, pastel sticks um, and steering wheels and various things. And so now we have these wonderful tool using abilities. But cetaceans, all whales, dolphins and porpoises evolved from terrestrial animals, from land-dwelling animals, and they took to the water uh, through many generations, through many different species along the way, to, from sort of like an otter-like initial, uh, there's various interesting early whales called like Ambulocetus is one of them, it looks kind of like, like a cross between a crocodile and an otter maybe, it's a really strange animal. 
and it would have lived an aquatic or amphibious kind of a life, being able to move around on land and on water to some extent. But it was already had a lot of, uh, of, of water um, definitive sort of features. And then later whales uh, developed more and more uh, water adapted and water specific features, including the fact that the what started out as, as uh, front legs uh, evolved into these pectoral fins or what we call flippers. And now they are used exclusively for swimming through the water. In this case, especially for stabilizing them in steering. And they use their tail, um, the body basically, and the, the, the specially evolved flukes, which don't exist on in any terrestrial animals. The flukes, the tail flippers of, of, the, of dolphins and whales and porpoises evolve de novo from, from nothing, from soft tissues in the tail. Um, and they are a specially newly evolved fin structure, but they, their body muscles um, generate the propulsion of their body sort of in an up and down motion and that then drives them forward using the, um, the flippers or the, the flukes in the back uh, to transform that up and down motion into forward propulsion. But the, the flippers uh, are used for steering mostly. So. I'm just gonna for the people watching online. I'm just gonna bring the uh, your computer screen back mm -hmm. so people can see what this animal yeah, actually looks That's like that we're going for. Exactly. This. So you can see how there must be, there are enormously powerful muscles in the trunk of the body, and uh, very very effective at generating the huge forces required to push this animal forward through this very viscous medium of the ocean. Um, and so it's really, really effective. Uh, they're just amazing to watch them move. And I've actually not had the privilege of seeing Dow's porpoise in the wild. I really hope I do someday. But I have seen other cetaceans swim at high speed. So for example, um, during my PhD, I had the opportunity to take part in three different deep ocean hydrothermal event expeditions where we went out to the ocean um, off the coast of Vancouver Island and s dropped a deep ocean submersible into the water to study uh, volcanic activity and the, the life surrounding these volcanic spreading centers in the ocean uh, at these hydrothermal vents, these deep ocean hydrothermal vents. And then on the way to and from the uh, vent locations, the ship was cruising at a pretty good speed. And then sometimes if we went outside and looked over the edge of the ship at the bow, at the front end of the ship, you, would, you could be lucky to spot a group of Pacific white-sided dolphins riding the bow wave of the ship. Because they, they love to do that. They, they generally uh, love to play. Uh, they're very play <laughs> dolphins are wonderfully playful. And they love to um, ride bow waves of ships because, of course, Bow waves are a place where the water is being pushed by the ship and they're basically getting a free ride surfing effectively this moving water wave um, so that they don't have to um, push their bodies so, so quickly to move at that speed. They don't have to use muscle power as much. They can basically borrow some of the ship's power that would otherwise be wasted in, in pushing the water out of its way. They're basically using the waste energy of the ship to power themselves, and they can travel at extraordinarily fast speed this way. The um, neat thing I, is that oh yeah, sorry, I've I've, yep. I've just managed and quite incredible. Oh, I've, oh good. I actually found a video that we have the right oh, nice. to the right to show because it's from our YouTube channel. This oh, is wow. what the rooster tailing actually looks like. Look at that. There you go. Look how fast they move through the water. These little flukes are just flapping really fast, pushing them through. So you can see how, yeah, exactly, those, those little splashes that, that go upward from their fins, from their dorsal fin um, as it clears the water. And it, it, at, if you were to take photos of this or slow this down, you would more easily see that uh, as the dorsal fin clears the surface, it creates this sort of arc of water uh, that looks like a rooster tail. And some photos actually show this quite nicely. Beautiful animals. And so you can see, this is clearly right from the um, bow of a ship because you can't see the, the ripples moving forward. So it's moving faster than, than the waves on the water, but we're moving forward along this. And this actually illustrates the nice fact that along with Pacific white-sided dolphins, um, Dow's porpoise actually like to ride the bow wave of ships as well. This is one of their common behaviors. Uh, so you'll have pods of several 
uh, that come together and they will actually associate sometimes with Pacific white-sided dolphins as one other species. Uh, and they, you will see them together with them at bow waves of ships and th that's got to be the neatest thing to see like that. And it's so unique for porpoises because normally right. we, we usually tell porpoises that porpoises tend to not even porpoise. We call them porpoises, but they don't actually show this porpoising behavior a lot. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. slowly rolling in and out of the water without a disturbance on the surface. You sometimes don't even realize they're there. And then you have the dulse porpoise, which of course has <laughs> to be this one outlier, which is so unique. Not only the unique shape of their bodies, but also that they're the fastest cetacean, the fastest of all of them. They can swim faster than a killer whale if they really want to. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, which is actually useful, too, because um, any kind of a, a marine mammal that's a top predator, such as killer whales or orcas, are a threat to um, smaller species that they might prey on. And so speed is very advantageous for uh, Dallas porpoise uh, being a very small cetacean uh, because that way they have less to worry about. They're faster than most species of sharks, too. There's only one shark species that is probably faster than them. I think the short fin wow. mako, which can travel at speeds up to, well, actually close to the same and maybe a little bit faster, but um, not by much. Um, and long fin mako is probably also very, very fast. There's a few really fast species of shark, but uh, the Dallas porpoise is faster than almost every one of them. So what I've done here, you can see, is after I've applied the pastel using the stick. I'm smoothing it out using this kind of a uh, little, it's like a, what is it? It's kind of like, like a spongy material that is very, very soft, very similar to what you might use, let's say, to apply makeup. Uh, and actually, it might actually be something that's modified from that. And it, it looks really very do. similar. I mean, if you can show it again to the camera, just so people... Yeah, um, yeah so here we go. Actually, it's uh, fine. This works too. I'll just put it over here. Yeah, that works too. You can actually, yeah, right. So I should just hold it close. That that works. So this is what it looks like close up. If I can just think in reverse where the camera is. Oops, there we go. See, it's kind of a spongy material. It's um, it's not, it's not um, fibrous like a brush. Um, it's continuous, but and I'm gonna just push this closer here. Well, actually, we can see it from above. That works. Um, it, it, it does a good Sorry. job. We have, we have three cameras <laughs> pointing. <laughs> we'll we'll work, your work this out over time. Yeah, we're 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 um, uh, perfecting things, and I'm having to try to think in reverse sometimes because of the way that the camera camera is angled is sort of upside down to me. So it's it's kind of funny to think of it that way. But it does a really great job of spreading the the pastel around. Not only that, but remember that I mentioned pastels have a tendency to come off the surface more easily, so it's hard to fix them to the surface. By doing this kind of spreading, I'm actually working it into the grooves and the little divots in the paper, into the fiber of the paper, so that actually ends up fixing the pastel to the surface a lot more effectively just on its own. Okay? So I have applied a lot of that dark material. So what we're seeing here is a very different technique than I have done on a lot of the how to draw webinars. Uh, instead of just mostly focusing on lines, I'm blocking in a lot of the color. This is what I find much more fun in many ways. It's basically akin to painting. And using that, that instrument, I would say that is close to what painting is like anyway. Basically, I'm just spreading a pigment around, which is really what you do with painting anyway. Um, I'm just applying it in a sort of different way initially, just using the stick itself. It's kind of like if you took watercolor and, you know, if you have like those, those blocks of, of solid watercolor, you just pulled out one of those little blocks from the tray and use that to rub the watercolor on the, onto the surface of the paper or, you know, alternatively use one of those watercolor pencils and then use a brush to spread it around using a, like a moistened brush to spread it with the water. Similar to that, except there's no water involved here. It's just dry, and the pigments themselves spread around because they're very fine particulate pigments. And so it's kind of a two-step process. Um, if I had access to that wonderful velour paper, and if I do, I'll bring that into the studio at one point and show you that as well, because I really love working on it. If I had access to that, I wouldn't really even have to spread it around a lot because that paper is a lot smoother, basically. It has less of this tooth than the Canson paper does. Canson paper is great if I wanted to make a really large painting with uh, pastel and just the pastel alone. 
But at this smaller size, I'm going to really have to kind of spread it around using these, um, that kind of like that shading stomp equivalent, that look brush-like thing that I've been using. So here we go. I'm basically applying all of the black now to the animal. And what you see here now is we're at in front of the fluke, so the tail, so the flipper, uh, the tail of the animal. And we see these two weird little bumps. And it's actually not even visible as much on the, the other illustration that I had, but there's actually two bumps. The one right before the flukes is a vertical uh, bump or hump, like a downward facing hump, very much like the one over here in uh, front of the flukes on top. And it functions in a similar way, analogously to the um, caudal, the precaudal keels in fish such as tuna, or some fast swimming sharks like mako sharks, which have uh, a vertically oriented tail that swishes side to side. And on each side of the body, just before the tail, you have these keels that stick out. These bits, uh, these sharp edged bits that um, stand out from the rest of the body. Uh, and they help to stabilize uh, the, the uh, animal uh, in the water in a vertical way and also reduce the drag as that part of the animal moves back and forth, slicing through the water. It effectively makes it like a knife so that it can slide through the water back and forth without much resistance so that it can generate most, transfer most of that energy into propulsion, pushing the animal forward using the, the tail fin. In Dallas porpoise, and because whales do an up and down motion of their body instead of side to side, uh, these humps on the back and on the underside of the animal function in the same way. They're just rotated 90 degrees off from that of sharks and tuna. And it makes sense because this animal moves its body up and down. So having these knife-like edges on the top and bottom of that moving part of the, of the trunk of the animal makes perfect sense to reduce water resistance on that up and down motion so that more of the energy of the animal can be transferred to the water being pushed by the flukes and transforming that into forward uh, propulsion. Uh, so again, beautiful example of a hydrodynamically optimized uh, shape for an animal that lives in the water and that travels at high speed through the water, where it becomes very important to maximize the efficiency of this motion because you, the faster you move, effectively, the more viscous the water feels to an animal, right? The, if you move really fast through water, you get more and more resistance much more so than in air. So it's effectively like, like moving through honey, effectively. Uh, so at higher speeds, this becomes super important. And it's exactly where we see it in these high speed cetaceans. I've just been uh, surfing the internet and I've found somebody who created a 3D model. Oh, very cool. Of, uh, of adults' purpose. Interesting, let's see how. has the... Yeah, you can see a little bit of that. Um... Yeah, the bump. Oh, this is like, a, it's carved out of wood or something, isn't it? Yeah, so I some of the so. proportions aren't quite there because the tail is, uh, the flukes are really <laughs> too thick, but it yeah, gives you thick. an idea of the overall shape, I guess. I'm not sure if they've got the, um, at the bottom, uh, there's that, there's normally sort of two bumps and the, the, the back, the, the more posterior bump is the one I, I've been talking about. But there's one in front of that that is actually a paired bump on both sides of the animal, on the underside, where that sort of that, that bumpy area begins underneath it. And that's actually a paired one. That's, that's sort of different looking. And belugas have a similar kind of a structure underneath their bodies. Uh, they're really neat that way. And they have a very strangely shaped cross section. If you've ever looked at a beluga, uh, you'll see that they have these very interesting uh, an underside with two sort of flanges that come out sideways. It's not like a round cross section through their body. Really interesting that way. And Dallas porpoise have a little bit of something like that happening near the back of their body. And um, for us here, because I'm drawing a, a Dali um, uh, subspecies, one that has the, the white patch uh, start only starting about halfway back. Um, I don't think that one shows it. No, that one's missing it. Yeah, that's, that's a simpler model. That one doesn't have the, the flanges on the sides. Um, so you'll actually find a lot of um, images and models on the web that miss some of these details. And as scientific uh, illustrators, 
we find it very important to try to be as accurate as possible uh, because there's a lot of educational value to portraying things accurately because uh, it, the, the fascinating bits are really in the details. Um, all of these, these fine little Grammarly structural components of the animals help have write. functions typically. And it's important to show them because then we can talk about those very specific functions that they serve. Um, and so, for example, you know, these precaudal keels in animals, depending on which way they move their body to pro propel themselves through the water, are very important to talk about, I think. So there, I've added pretty much all of the black pigment. Um, yeah, that one's also missing it. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's very it's hard fine. to find a really accurate portrayal. Yeah. We would, I'm yeah. going to try and find an actual underwater video. It's sort of Yeah, a exactly. A video of a live animal is the best because... <laughs> Uh, they those would show that that really interesting. If you took if you looked at a cross section of a beluga uh, near like a little bit back from their middle, it would actually be almost bell shaped cross section. You have that rounded top part and then these two flanges on the sides near the bottom. Uh, it really really interesting. And the Dallas porpoise near the back end of the animal also has a little bit of that flange, but not quite as much as belugas. Belugas are spectacular that way. I'm just going to try and. Mm -hmm. Oops, what did I do? <laughs> no, <laughs> I help is too late for me. No. Um, <laughs> We're, yeah, if we look at the underside of an animal, you, you, it's hard to see it there. Uh, you can start to see it a little bit, though. You can see how the, the shadow um, is much sharper along that edge of the flange. Um, some of them, if you see them on the belly, on the one, no, actually, you can't. Yeah, that one shows a little bit in the middle there with the, with the calf. One? Oh, the one yeah, with the calf. you can see that, that flange a little bit better, but you can't see it as well here. You can see how it kind of widens out there though and it would be on both sides if you looked at the the belly of a beluga you'd see that a lot more clearly actually i think it's harder to find pictures of the belly of a uh, a dallas porpoise because they're photographed much less frequently than other cetaceans like belugas and that's the front end if you looked at the back end of the belly you would see that more clearly uh, it's so hard to find that people on the internet can you not photograph the right side of the <laughs> underside exactly. of it well at the time when the Vancouver Aquarium still had belugas, um, I remember seeing them and when they swam by and they would do various kind of acrobatics underwater, you would see this very clearly um, as they swam by. And so you can see it in photographs or sometimes in person that way. Uh, that's no longer possible, but I do remember that clearly and I took photos as well, which I should actually bring those next time to show them. Um, but. Um, yeah, they're they're actually at the very top of that page. I think you see a not a bad example of it. There you go. See, there's that sort of yeah. widening. Some of them have it a lot more pronounced as well. And I don't actually know what is the purpose of that. What they what is their function? Yeah. Um, to make it less of a teleological <laughs> context there, because you know there isn't like an initial purpose for it, and it functions a certain way, but it's not designed. It happens to uh, be selected for out of a population that shows adequate variation initially. Um, but yes, you end up getting a similar kind of a thing. So here we go. I'm just smoothing out all of this pigment now. So we've got a nicely darkened animal. And to this, I'm going to add highlights. Uh, now we're dealing with a much darker animal than, than most. Last time we dealt with the the orcas, but I was working on black paper, so I actually didn't have to put the dark pigment in place. In this case, I am doing that because I like to choose the blue background um, because it's going to function really nicely for our oceanic backdrop here. It's about the right color for some of this dark, deep water. And now I have to, of course, put the, the animals lighter or darker shades in. <sighs> okay, so that's most of it. I'm also kind of moving a little faster than I normally would be because uh, if I had all the time in the world, I would take more time with the details. But this is kind of a speed painting uh, event. And so I'm going to have to kind of uh, average some of the stuff out a little bit more than I would otherwise. And so we're getting a little bit uh, lower quality detail, but uh, I'm sacrificing that for higher speed. So what I'm going to do now is uh, add some of the highlights to this individual, and then we'll um, move to the next one. But for this part, 
Uh, we're going to do two things. One, add the white to this uh, beautiful belly patch that they have. And that's actually going to show up a lot more starkly. I really like working with these light colors on this blue paper. It's, it's, I love working with light colors on dark paper, dark um, medium anyway. It's just really satisfying to see it applied somehow. I enjoy that a lot. Uh, and then we're going to do a similar thing to the back of the animal. Now, if I had been uh, thinking about another way to do this, I could have not added black to the whole animal. I'm really thinking as a painter here, I, I add a base coat and then apply upper coats. It might not work as well with pastels, but it should still work pretty well, actually. Otherwise, I could have used, let's say, a lighter color, like maybe Payne's Gray, to apply the darker area above, uh, anticipating the way that the black would normally look a little lighter, like gray, on the top end of the animal because of the effect of sunlight on that uh, upper part of the animal. But this will work too. So you can see how well this white is showing up. This color of paper is really beautiful uh, to use as a background. And um, I know that other artists have done this as well. Uh, I have the privilege of knowing an artist by the name of Steve White. Uh, he does a lot of these beautiful uh, drawings and paintings. I think it's mostly it's drawings uh, with colored pencil and uh, other media on colored paper. And he does a spectacular job on different kinds of uh, background colored papers. And he was uh, actually also the, um, at the time, the editor and author who invited me to collaborate with him to create uh, a book of, sort of a, a definitive book of my artwork, um, which still to this day is probably the best one showing most of my artwork, which is the paleo art of Julius Chetigny. And so thank you, Steve, for that absolutely wonderful opportunity to showcase my work in a book. Uh, that was really kind of a, a big moment for me. Uh, anyway, his work is spectacular this way and uh, on these colored papers. And if you ever try this, I think you'll find it extremely satisfying to work on colored paper like this. What I'm going to do now is since I've got all this white on the side here, I'm going to actually go backward a little bit with some of it on the very bottom because the animal shades itself. So I'm using a little bit of Payne's gray on the bottom here to adjust the tone of the, of the white because the underside is going to be darker. But two things will happen. One, it's going to be darker, so I've got some Payne's gray. But I'm also going to add a little bit more of a, a blue as well because we have uh, the, the color of the water around it influencing the color of the shadows, right? Shadows are very much influenced by the, the light, the ambient light around them. Uh, basically, it's just a subtraction of the main source of light, the sunlight, and every other sources of light around it coming from below and the sides is very much filtered by the water and becomes a blue color. Okay? So the shadows in the ocean tend to be a lot bluer in color. Even on land, you have shadows that are typically um, blue in some cases or shaded parts of, of subjects in the air are often blue because on a bright sunlit day with a lot of blue sky, that blue uh, from the sky ends up being uh, cast onto the animal even in the shaded areas where the direct sunlight is, is, is overshadowed by some other, uh, either another part of the same subject or some other subject. Uh, over top of it. Okay. So here we go. So it took me it took me about like half the event to get there, but <laughs> I think I've got a, a good top shot now. That we yeah, can that's really see good this. actually, because you're kind of closer here, and now we can see a little bit more of the details. I like that. That's really nice. And so you can see now here this kind of gradient I have from the bright white on the sides, and I'll actually brighten that a little further to an increasingly darker. Uh, color at the bottom here where the animal's curvature of its sides influences the light by intercepting that light and then overshadowing the undersurface of the animal. But remember we talked about that sort of that flange on the side and that starts right here. And so what I'm going to do to show that that it's actually a separate structure is add a little bit of highlight to the edge of that because this is what we see here and it's not going to be that bright but I'm going to start subtracting some of that and adding it to the brighter parts of the animal. So you'll see that this area becomes a little bit more highlighted. And 
that shows... I'm sorry, there's a... Yeah, sorry. It's all part of the program. It's all part of the program, the yeah. Campus. That's not my phone. It's <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Um, there we go. So now you can see that that part is a little bit brighter, even though it's near the bottom of the animal, for good reason. And I'm going to, again, subtract out a little bit of it above here. You know, painting um, natural colors and tones is a very much a back and forth process. You sometimes have to go and add a bit of shade, then a little bit of highlight, and then you kind of average towards something that you finally want. If you really know what you're doing and you apply it initially, then it's, then it's great, but um, not everybody can do that. Uh, there are a few people that are absolute masters at this uh, process, though. Um, a couple of them that come to mind that some of you may well know are uh, James Gurney does a spectacular job of painting with light. He's a, an amazing master of light. Uh, James Gurney, uh, John Agnew is incredible with this as well. And uh, Tony Pridham, I hope I didn't uh, destroy your last name there from, from <laughs> Australia, also one of my favorite painters in the world. Um, so absolutely great work by some people that, that are wonderful masters of lighting and shade. Uh, and so here we go. So we've got a little bit of that shadow on the side of the animal. In fact, I'll give it a wee bit more at the very, very bottom because it is a dark, deep water that it's over. So we don't have, like I mentioned last time on our last episode with the orcas where we, you know, they're in very shallow water, let's say, then you'll have that, that light coming from the rocks below them reflected onto the animal, onto the shaded part of the animal otherwise. But that's not happening here because this animal is over deep water. We mentioned before that Dale's porpoise like to hunt over very deep water. And so there, there's really not much light coming up from below. It's a very darker color or tone. Um, I'm going to start adding highlights to the upper part of the animal. And as we do, we're also going to start to talk about some of the conservation concerns of this animal. And so Dow's porpoise are currently classified by the uh, International Union uh, for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, uh, as having a status, a conservation status of least concern, which basically usually means that their population is not imminently threatened. Uh, but that in itself um, hides some detail that is very relevant to us, especially these days. One of the biggest problems is that their population trajectory or the trends, the changes in their population are not well known. It, it, when you look it up, when you look them up um, on the IUCN's website, it is listed as unknown. And that's a problem. Until we can actually determine which way their population is, whether it's growing or shrinking, we have to be very careful with how our activities influence them, especially then, because they, we may well be hurting them a lot more than we realize. Yeah. And I think often it's uh, there. There are also some porpoises where the conservation status is data deficient, which is even worse. But right. the, the 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 cause for these two things that we have an unknown trajectory is, uh, and some species that are data deficient is basically the same. It's really hard to study porpoises. As porpoises, they are a little bit more surface active, so might might be easier. But um, you also need to be interested in actually wanting to do that research and. Uh, finding out uh, what's happening to those populations and for the Dallas purpose we we're not seeing that we were talking about some of the some of the pressures that they're facing in the mm -hmm. wild because um, even though we don't know what the population trajectory is in in some parts of the world just like japan um they're actually actively hunting for the yeah. species it's a it's a problem um because so they're actually uh, as far as I know, in Japan, the they're used for meat. They're they're eaten, um, and the the cost of of Dallas porpoise meat is something like one third of that of beef. And so, of course, there is a large incentive um, for them to be hunted there uh, for uh, consumption. And unfortunately, right now, the populations are. Um, there are, there are about at least two populations in the Western Pacific that can easily be, be reached by this hunting, these hunting practices. And so there are, there are two of them that, that tend to migrate between the Sea of Okotsk and, uh, and Japan. And these uh, were, at last uh, estimate, 
measured at between 170,000 and 180,000 individuals each. Japan takes roughly 18,000 per year, which comes out to be about 5% of the entire population of those uh, porpoises in their waters every year, which is a really large a number. Uh, that, that's a crazy amount of the global population of Dal's porpoise. They're yeah. taking 5%. That's yeah. insane. Uh, well, 5% of not the global, but of that of, the, of, of, of those, those populations those two that reach combined there. Populations. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Which is, it's really, really quite massive. Um, so this is where, yeah, as you said, we really need to have better data. We have need to have more studies of their populations. We need to understand better what, what their populations are doing. Are they increasing or decreasing? Because we've seen indications that on on the, the west coast of North America, some of the populations may have decreased. Uh, I mean, there, there are experts in the Porpoise Conservation Society that know a lot more about this than, than I could ever imagine. But, uh, and, and they'd be able to answer these a lot better. But even from what I've read, I've seen indications that, that some of these populations have likely decreased from historical highs. Uh, so we are in dangerous waters, so to speak, with respect to the conservation of Dallas porpoise. So it's not just active hunting that, that, that is a risk to them, of course. That's just one of the risks. And you know that's more active in one part of the world. But the other big problem they face is the same one that's faced by the currently most threatened, most uh, highly endangered uh, marine mammal in the world, the vaquita, uh, around which we based the show uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the International Save the Vaquita Day broadcast that we did from this uh, studio as well. And that was a, a really, uh, really great show because for once we have seen indications that their numbers might not have currently decreased as much in the last year, uh, but they have decreased to a global total of, what is it, between eight and 13 individuals? That's all. And the reason for that is that they are becoming entangled in illegally set gill nets uh, by poachers, which have been set for another critically endangered species, uh, this time a fish, called the tatuaba. And so this is also a problem for Dallas porpoise. They become entangled in fishing nets. And when they do, they can either become uh, totally stuck in it and drown, or uh, they can take, they, they may loosen some of it and, and have it drag along with them and so it can get caught, caught in their flukes and tangled or around their dorsal fin or flippers and then they drag along these nets. And of course, in an animal that has evolved to be so hydrodynamically optimized for high speed, that's going to massively influence the efficiency of its swimming. And that efficiency is necessary for it to effectively hunt its prey. And so suddenly this dragging net causes fatigue uh, and reduces its ability to hunt, which causes it to starve as well. So you have animals that then die from uh, you know, malnutrition or fatigue uh, from those kinds of stressors due to longer term entanglement effects. So really horrible, really bad. It must be a very painful way for them to die, the poor little ones. So these are another uh, major form of a threat to them. There's also pollution, so uh, runoff from various kinds of land-based activities uh, can cause all kinds of dangerous chemicals to enter the water. And because Dallas porpoise, like a lot of other cetaceans, are apex predators, or predators that basically are at the top of their given food web, um, they uh, experience something that we call biomagnification or bioaccumulation. They, their fat tissues, their blubber, of which they have a lot as cetaceans, they have a lot of blubber, tends to collect a lot of dangerous uh, certain pollutants that accumulate there, uh, including mercury, for example. And this is one of the arguments for why they shouldn't be hunted or and eaten, because um, studies have shown that Dallas porpoise meat contains two to three times the, uh, the upper limit uh, um, 
in Japan of what is considered safe for mercury consumption in, in, uh, in, in food. So that's, it actually makes it very dangerous for people to be eating this long term because as we know, mercury has horrible <laughs> neurological effects on our systems. Mercury is not healthy. Don't consume yeah. mercury. No, <laughs> yeah, stay away from mercury. Yeah, the, uh, don't eat it. Uh, that's the thing. And, and don't, you know, especially the kinds of mercury. So chemistry is wonderfully complex and there are some forms of mercury that are a lot safer when interacting with biological materials. So for example, um, uh, certain kinds of complexes actually aren't as big of a threat, but the particular kinds that appear in marine life that's stored in their tissues are not good for us. They can do a lot of harm. We don't have the ability to store it the same way that it happens in them. And of course, this can also harm the animals themselves. But for anyone eating them, especially an apex predator, there's going to be a lot more mercury in their bodies because they're eating fish that have accumulated some mercury, which in turn have accumulated mercury from the, 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 the smaller fish or invertebrates that they eat and so on that have been accumulated from the water by filter feeding plankton and so on. So all of this ends up in the tissues of these uh, apex predators. And if we eat the apex predators, we're gonna have even higher amount of this biomagnification effect. Really, really bad news for us. Okay, so there we go. So that is most of the, the Dallas porpoise that's underwater, with the exception of some interesting details. And that is, we talked about last time, these phenomenon called caustics. Caustics, as we talked about last time, result from the way in which sunlight, when it passes through the surface of the water, um, is lensed by the curved shape of waves, uh, and that lensing effect will cause it to be uh, maximally, uh, undergo this constructive interference, to be uh, brightest, basically focused in certain parts. And so under a, certain, under a wave, you might have this little bit of lensing and you have these, these bright lines and curves and, and, and various geometric patterns that appear on the back of, this, of a subject that's underwater. Uh, and these patterns are called caustics. And they change depending on the shapes of the waves, the size of the wave, the shape of the waves, how rough they are, how smooth the water is. If it's completely, perfectly smooth water, then you won't get any caustics because there's no lensing at all. Uh, if it's very turbulent water, like lots of, lots of tiny waves and waves of all sizes and shapes intersecting each other, then you also might not get clear caustics because the len there's no clear lensing from any one source and it's all intersecting with each other and then you get this, this sort of mishmash and it's basically kind of gets smeared out into a, a, a general kind of wash of light. So something in between with um, uh, nicely defined waves gives you the best caustics. Here we have, we're gonna have sort of smeared out caustics a bit because the waves in our scene are not going to be very sharp tipped, uh, not very small, they're kind of slow rolling waves. So you got a little bit of highlights lensed here and there on the back of the animal, but not very clearly. You actually see this quite a lot in marine environments. It's in some of the, the wonderful um, uh, sort of in-between levels of weather that you get the best caustics. <laughs> when you get some waves, but, but not too terribly uh, turbulent. So it's fascinating to study the optics phenomena that uh, that regulate the way in which light is cast onto the backs of subjects in marine environments. I really enjoy uh, learning about that and then applying that in my artwork. And so we did that last time with the orca uh, drawing that I did in colored pencils, and it had some very, very sharp caustics on it uh, because, of course, the waves in that setting generated that. But here we have some smeared out caustics, and this is sort of a common thing that you see as well. So again, toward the side of the animal, the caustics vanish. They only appear in directly sunlit parts or these places where waves can um, transmit light directly downward um, onto any surface that, that they can reach. Anything that's overshadowed by the body of the animal will not have any caustics on it unless waves can somehow lens light into that region as well. It's all about logic, perfectly logical. Uh, figuring out how to draw caustics can be done very formulaically. Uh, so just think about 
the physics of what you're dealing with, the water medium, and the way that light uh, intersects it, or sort of plays in it. Um, very interesting to think about that. Uh, I, I love to think sort of logically like that, and then you get to sort of generate these models in your mind of what you would expect to see, and then you can ground truth them with photographs. Uh, I'm not actually using photos right here. I'm going from not memory so much as reasoning, uh, and memory of photographs as well, to generate these caustics uh, in this image here, of uh, sort of an in-between level of wave activity, kind of a low wave activity, so there's not a lot of lensing happening, just a little bit. These are longer waves, and so you don't have that really sharp caustics that's generated uh, where the waves might be uh, round enough to create a nice lensing effect below them. Okay, so that's most of the animal down below. What I'm going to do now is actually add an interesting bit of um, a component uh, under the surface of the water to show the light coming down. And this kind of adds a beautiful level of sort of um, the environment around the animal and that really helps us to kind of um, uh, give the animal this, this really nice sort of context of where it's where it is in its environment. So I'm just going to take this bigger this is kind of like that other tool I had, except it's larger, it's squishy as well. And basically you can see the shape of it allows me to kind of smear it in a very sort of a wider uh, path than the previous one. It's so, it's not an eraser, right? It no, has a similar... No, it's not an eraser. It's kind of a spongy, soft material. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could, you exactly. You could use this camera over there. Mm -hmm. If I, I think... do that, then you can see it. Oops. Uh... I'm not sure it's going to focus <laughs> it's properly. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I and mean, you can get that picture though. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, funny enough, most of my puns are actually unintended. Um, just those are the best. Yeah, happy yeah. coincidences. Yeah. <laughs> but or, or you know, grown worthy or whatever you prefer. <laughs> anyway, so you can see what I'm doing here is uh, I intend to draw this sharp line at the edge of the water, which is basically where we imagine that the, let's say there's a plate of glass that's intersecting the surface of the water. And we're able to see along that. So above the, the surface of the water that intersects that plate, we have a view down onto the surface of the water. And then uh, if we look underneath that line, we can see things that are under the surface. And so we're seeing that animal, the, the, um, the Dallas porpoise under it. And I'm also adding these lines, distributing the pigment in a sort of a linear fashion to emulate um, the way in which light uh, moves through the water and you know intersects or intercepts um, bubbles and other debris uh, flock or marine um, phytoplankton or whatever little components little particles might be in the water yeah. and that scatter the light and that's I'm, why we see it i'm just i've got an interesting uh comment i'm actually gonna mm -hmm. bring that up on screen um Bill says, uh, "I doubt there's going to be much of the uh, of this referring to the light caustics mm -hmm. uh, if the sky was overcast." Is that good true? point? Or? Excellent point. Uh, that yeah, that, that's actually a really good point. The sharpest caustics are going to be when the sun is out, because the sun is is almost a point source of light and a brilliant light, almost not quite point source, but for all intents and purposes, for underwater, it's close to a point source, and that can then be lensed by the water are very effectively. Kind of like if you use a magnifying glass, you can get, if there's, the sun is out, then you can get this beautiful sharp point of light if you, um, if you put the, the, the magnifying glass at the, the proper distance from the paper or whatever. That's basically what, what caustics are. They're like the, the light coming through a magnifier and the waves are the magnifying glass in this case. And yes, if you don't have bright sun out, but it's in fact instead overcast, then you're gonna get this diffuse light. And that's when you get some of these, partly some of these really wide sort of smeared out caustics. The other time you can get this more smeared out caustics is if you're at a suboptimal distance from the wave, depending on its shape, uh, for where it would be maximally focused. Because there's gonna be an optimum distance under that particular shape of wave where the light will be focused most. If you go below that or above that, depending on that shape of wave, you're not going to get those sharp caustics, but you still will get brighter caustics under bright sunlight. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a complex interplay of the brightness of the, of the light, the distribution of light coming from above, and the shape and size of the wave through which they're passing. Really neat kind of stuff. So thank you very much for the comment. That's actually a really good point. 
Yeah, and somebody else also mentioned Dragon a God and says this type of foam is also used in makeup applications. Oh, there you so. go. So I okay, so that's I was right. That it it felt it looked like something you might expect there. So there you go. Um, a lot of people in our audience may well also be um, in the film industry, and they may well be familiar with uh, many of the techniques that are used. Uh, including the application of makeup to generate special effects, for example, in, on actors. Um, and, and that's where you would expect some of these to be. In addition to, yeah, the application of makeup uh, for touching up the faces of, of people that appear on screen in any case, which makes a lot of sense. And, and yeah, this is totally exactly what you would expect. I think some of these tools may well be initially uh, makeup tools. Um, or they're just shared between the different uh, uh, disciplines uh, and because they're useful in similar ways. I mean, really, what I'm doing here is, is adding makeup to the paper in, in the same way. I'm trying to spread it very, very smoothly to generate this nice, smooth sort of effect, which is exactly what you want in many cases in, in makeup to kind of have these beautiful, smooth gradients on the face. Okay, so there we go. So the other thing, so we have direct hunting, that's a problem. We also have uh, pollutants that will often accumulate in the tissues of uh, Dow's porpoise and other cetaceans. And then there's a, a, a and we have uh, gnats that we also talked about, them becoming entangled in gnats, that's a huge problem as well. And uh, noise, marine noise is another big one. So these days, with so much shipping traffic, uh, both pleasure craft, such as ocean liners, as well as the cargo carrying uh, giant ships and everything else. Uh, the especially those small boats as well, right? If you have a lot of those tiny boats. recreational yeah. vessels with like yeah. their really whiny, yeah. fast engines. All kinds of frequencies, of right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, plus, you have military uh, activities uh, at sea, from detonations, uh, you know, testing various weaponry, uh, to just the large ships themselves, aircraft carriers and destroyers and so on, gigantic submarines. I remember uh, being outside, inside my place one night, I think I mentioned this last time too, and hearing what sounded like a truck engine outside on my block, and I went outside to check, this was at night time. It turned out, um, I was curious to see how far I could follow the sound. It wasn't on my block. It wasn't a few blocks away. I walked all the way about half, a, a kilometer to the coast and found that the sound simply got louder. It was actually the idling diesel engine of one of those giant oh. cargo craft uh, wow. kilometers away on the water. And it was loud enough that in the, through the air, I could hear it as loud as I would expect a truck idling on my block to be sounding from indoors. That's crazy. And that's in the air. Imagine underwater, which transmits sound at much higher energy, how any organisms living underwater would experience these sounds. They'd be even more intense and more damaging. And of course, there is research demonstrating that they do physical damage to the, the auditory uh, structures in cetaceans. So yeah, it's very dangerous. It's a big problem. It's not just annoying, it's far more. It interferes with not just their ability to hear their prey, but also for communication. Cetaceans uh, are well known for their tendency to communicate using clicks and whistles uh, and other sounds with their species. Not just for you know, groups to uh, you know, discuss whatever they're discussing, because some of them have complex language, but to find mates and therefore to successfully reproduce. You, you interfere with that ability for them to, in, to communicate, we're not gonna have the same rate of reproduction and therefore the ability to recover from other problems that have depressed their populations. It, it interferes with everything that they do, right? Acoustic sound is so important for cetaceans because yep. like you said, they use it to find food, they use it to find mates, they use it for communication and also yep. for avoidance of anything that might be in their way, like a net, for instance. Oh, good point. Good point. Because yeah, cetaceans are one of the few organisms known to use sound for echolocation. Um, interfering with that could very much endanger them. Uh, they might not perceive threats in their environment. To be able to record those threats uh, from the, the sort of the back, the reflected pings of their sonar. And if you interfere with that, they could more likely potentially become entangled in uh, nets because they maybe can't see these, effectively see these nets using echolocation 
uh, effectively enough when there's so much other white noise surrounding them that interferes with their hearing and has maybe even damaged their hearing at certain frequencies. So yeah, big, big, big problems there. I'm, I'm going to bring up another uh, viewer comment that you can see in the, mm -hmm. on the screen in front of you as well. Mm -hmm. um, Poi Pao is saying, I know motorboats going at full speed bug me when I'm at the beach and I'm not even in the water. Yeah, imagine the the, the sound that, that you can hear above water yeah. is going to be a fraction of yes. of that level of annoyance than what, especially those high frequency sounds is what yes. you're going to hear right below that if you're in the yeah, water. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, water, when it vibrates... Because it's a much denser medium than air, it carries a lot more energy in those vibrations. And so anything that it impacts, such as the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the hearing structures of marine mammals, it's going to um, impact those a lot more as well. And so it'll be effectively a more energetic or louder sound. Um, and it, it, it's not so much that it does damage to the eardrums of, the, of, of marine mammals, but well, aside from the fact that when we're talking about detonations, uh, you know, for naval testing and so on, there you can actually have actual damage, actual damage yeah. or, or, or a disruption of tissues because of the impact of these shock waves. That can actually kill. Uh, but uh, more than that, uh, the sound, long exposure to certain sounds, can damage some of the, the cells uh, in the cochlea. Of, um, of marine mammals and make them effectively deaf to certain frequencies of sound, which is a big problem. It is. And I'm actually going to uh, give us a little bit of a break. Uh, this is still a three-hour program, mm -hmm. but we decided that uh, yeah. we're going to take a little bit of a break. So for 10 minutes or so, uh, we're going to leave you to whatever need, uh, you need to be doing. Uh, like if you need to like consider this a pee break. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> we use it for very much the same purposes, and um, we'll be back we'll in be back. about ten minutes. And we'll be working on the on the surface uh, Dallas purpose. So now a whole new uh, techniques for above the water. So interesting stuff there. So I'm starting to add some of the water there. So I'm gonna uh, get back to you about that, and we're gonna learn some more techniques for above water um, uh, components here. All right. So we'll be right back. Stay with us. Are we still broadcasting? Okay, we're getting we're getting rid of the inspirational music. Um, <laughs> we're back from our break. Thanks for watching. This is uh, Canvas and Currents, episode number two. Uh, last month we talked about killer whales or orcas, and uh, this month um, we're really excited to be talking about uh, Dalt's porpoise, um, the species that Julius on screen now hi julius <laughs> he's our resident artist this program is all about uh life art um in combination with science conservation and of course your feedback uh, we want to answer all your questions i found my own camera here that's great um <laughs> and um just this little bit of a housekeeping announcement we have about one and a half hours left of our program today and if there's anything you want to know if you have any questions any feedback please uh, let us know. You're more than welcome to send us those comments through the various channels that we're broadcasting on. And uh, I just want to read out one little bit of feedback. There's a bit of conversation going on on the mm -hmm. Marine Memo Rescue Twitch channel. Oh, cool. Somebody said, I have to start this comment. Where is it? Oh, yeah, here. Really love the science talk <laughs> combined with the art instruction, understanding the physics behind the visual phenomena can be so important to making realistic or even some kinds of stylized art. Plus, it's really interesting. Thank you so much well, for that feedback. That's really nice to hear. Um, I, I love to hear feedback like that. Um, I, I really enjoy uh, doing these kinds of programs where we get to merge these different disciplines and uh, have a chance to present not just you know one of them like we could talk science you know I could, I'm a biologist so I, I have a lot of enthusiasm about biology but I'm also an artist 
And I love to use artwork uh, in an educational way this way. So we can do that here. We can combine artwork as a technique um, to be able to chat about science. And also we can use all of this to hopefully uh, encourage all of us to live lives where we show more concern for the species around us. And uh, that's where, of course, conservation comes in. We have so many different ways in which we can, um, we can live our lives that maximize the benefit or minimize the negative impact to other species, our neighboring species, our, our host species, the ones that make life possible for us on Earth here. We couldn't exist by ourselves here without other species. I mean, we were talking today about how, you know, at the very least, uh, people sometimes eat um, porpoises. I mean, I, I personally would prefer not to, but, um, but the point is that, that they give us so many important um, uh, benefits to life. For example, whales have uh, recently been shown to help to mitigate climate change by helping to um, reduce effectively the amount of uh, carbon emissions in the atmosphere um, by helping to sort of fix some of that carbon, um, move it away from the atmosphere and, and into a, a form that ends up being locked away more effectively. So whales, cetaceans in general, are very, very crucially important to our uh, marine ecological webs. Um, and the way that they interact with other species uh, very much affects uh, what we get out of the ocean as well. And so we need to preserve them, not just because they're beautiful and we love to live and coexist with them and enjoy the sounds they make, uh, the, 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 the beautiful view, like this, this humpback that's preaching behind me <laughs> on the screen. I, it's, it's so inspiring to see them, you know, on a screen and even more so when you see them live. We need people to experience that because I know that it's a transformative experience. From my own experience, when I've seen animals in the wild, you know, safely uh, and, and uh, respectfully uh, of their way of life to not interfere, but you can see them um, from a distance, from a safe distance. It is absolutely transformative. It, is, it makes such an impression. These are the kinds of memories that stick with you for life and that can change your life change um, how you see the world around you. It's really profound how powerful that is. I, I can say from my experience for sure, I know and I've read that uh, about many other people's experiences as well. So we'd like to get more people, um, you know, get out and see this wildlife, you know, when it's here and we need to preserve them so that they're there for people in the future to see as well. But in addition to that, we have all of these other important aspects, like they help to uh, stabilize food webs and to you know stabilize the um, the interactions between other species, so that you have a more diverse ecosystem. It's just there's there are myriad ways in which they benefit us and the entire planet. We need to have them around. <laughs> and it's I, I guess that that's what makes living on earth worth living on earth i cannot imagine yeah. life on earth without all that biodiversity we might as well live yeah. under a glass dome on yep. mars exactly. uh, without any life all around us i don't think that would yeah. be that pleasant well i mean i yeah i mean it would be fascinating to explore it but i, <laughs> I personally would rather choose to live on earth um and also because uh, if there's a chance as a microbiologist and especially somebody who's interested in astrobiology um uh, there is a very good chance that life could have emerged on Mars in the early days as well. Uh, it emerged extraordinarily quickly on Earth and conditions on Mars uh, may well have been slightly more favorable in the early days to the emergence of life chemically than on Earth, for all we know. There are, there's some evidence to suggest that. Uh, and therefore, if life emerged there and it would have been microbial and remained microbial, it, just like on Earth, there's the chance that some of it could have gone deep underground. And if that's the case, then there is no requirement that it would all have died when Mars lost the majority of its atmosphere over, uh, you know, about a couple of billion years ago. Um, if that's the case, there is a decent chance that life may well exist on Mars today. Now, of course, we have no evidence of that directly. Uh, but there is, uh, it's plausible. 
And if it's plausible, then we want to be really careful not to bring our own microbes uh, to Mars because the conditions uh, in the subsurface of Mars in some places are quite habitable to uh, Earth life, to Earth microbes. And we don't want accidentally to destroy an entire biosphere potentially by introducing uh, highly invasive microbes from Earth into an environment where we don't know there might be a native biosphere present. So we've got to be careful when we study things. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's a good idea to, to fix our own planet first before we ruin others. And that's uh, the other thing. <laughs> yes. I mean, no, I, not to say that we shouldn't explore. I think it's oh, fascinating. Exploring is wonderful. That's the whole basis of, uh, of, of what makes us excited as scientists. Um, just it, we just have to keep in mind that we have to be careful in exploring. And we have to be really careful when other things take place as well. Like we don't want to colonize Mars right now because that's when you... All bets are off for being careful to avoid contamination because anytime you have, um, you know, lack of, of, of care when you have a large number of people who haven't all been trained in this carefully, it's going to get out in that case. So I, I, I personally am very much against the prospect <laughs> of colonizing Mars. At least, <laughs> at least with our current state of yeah. technology and what we know about about Mars. Maybe right. there is no life well, after all, but actually, who, who knows? Right. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, questions. there are so many potential pockets of, of, of micro environments that might be favorable. And we don't know if, if there was life on Mars originally, uh, and if it did retreat to the subsurface to get away from the ionizing radiation and the, the, the strongly oxidizing chemicals and so on on the surface, it may be that it only survived in certain pockets. And so if we study a large area, and again, it's hard to study the subsurface. You need the right instruments to get down below and into the right depth. Who knows where the life has survived if it was there in the first place and it retreated. So we might miss it if we do sort of a very, very um, cursor, uh, cursory study of, of, the, of the surface or the subsurface of Mars, and we might conclude uh, erroneously that there is no life. So again, it's really hard to say that for sure. <laughs> the one thing I, that I do know for sure, like I'm 99% uh, certain that there are absolutely no Dell's porpoise on Mars. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty certain of that too. Um, <laughs> the exception to that would be, uh, if you want to think of this sort of uh, speculatively, if, if there was a way, how would you get Dell's porpoise to Mars? You would need an impactor on Earth large enough to liberate large enough chunks of the surface of Earth that they would contain Dallas porpoise and that those Dallas porpoise wouldn't be blown off the surface of these rocks. <laughs> so it would have to be somehow, well, maybe fossils, right? And then large enough pieces that would then have enough energy from the impactor to also go up the gravitational well to a planet further uh, away from the sun, which is much harder to do than the reverse and then survive re-entry and impact without complete destruction, which is uh, basically effectively impossible for anything larger than a microbe. Uh, microbes have been shown to theoretically survive all um, stages of this uh, process of transferring material from one planet to another. There have been studies that have shown that microbes of certain kinds can survive all parts of this journey. Uh, we have no evidence that it actually happened, but in theory, it could. It's plausible, uh, but yeah, we wouldn't get a Dallas porpoise on Mars. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> so. never going to complain again about traveling economy. Um, <laughs> with that in mind, that doesn't sound like a pleasant journey. Hey, um, at least there's legroom, right? Lots of <laughs> lots, <Some>. yeah, like <laughs> not so much air, and it's pretty warm. No air conditioning. That's the other thing. Um, okay, um, so let's let's get back to the Dallas porpoise, and I'm going to show a top down view because you've been so secretly painting yeah, without people adding. knowing. Exactly. So I've been adding a little bit of highlights to the back of the porpoise because there was this black line on top and I wanted to eliminate that. So we have this sort of nice little uh, highlighted upper edge of the animal um, where the, the light hits it first. And so uh, that. And then, as I mentioned just before the break, we're going to move above the water after this. And um, I've actually started to fill in up here uh, parts of that animal that is that we're seeing down from above the water, right at the surface of the water, and it's swimming very quickly and is generating a rooster tail behind it. So what we're seeing here is this little blob of white 
is kind of that foam, a bunch of bubbles, just as the animal's um, the front end of its like this this hump area is intersecting the surface and is generating some turbulence up there. Uh, and then we'll put in the dorsal fin, and from the dorsal fin there will be this rooster tail of water also being flung aside as the animal's uh, back clears the water. And so we get to see kind of what it looks like if you were to see a Dallas porpoise, take a photo of a Dallas porpoise at the surface, basically. And so yeah, this is kind of the bubbly turbulence around the um, leading edge of the animal, but below the dorsal fin and in front of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, now the techniques are different for, uh, some of the techniques are different for drawing subjects above water. I mean, most of what we've talked about so far on this show are techniques for uh, drawing and painting subjects underwater. And uh, of course, those uh, come with very particular um, application of or, or reference to uh, certain uh, laws of optics and the way in which light behaves when it, it um, uh, sort of is transmitted between the, the air and, and water mediums. Uh, as it crosses that interface between air and water, things happen as it's refracted across the surface. And how uh, there are certain angles, uh, critical angles, uh, beyond which it is either refracted or reflected. Uh, when it you know hits the water um, at certain angles. Now in the air, we have uh, light can come from all different directions uh, and reflected. Uh, yeah, the, directly sunlight can come from all different angles. Underwater, as we mentioned last time, there are limits to the direction in which uh, actual sunlight can be transmitted because of Snell's law. And you can look that up. It's an interesting sort of phenomenon. But in the air, you can have sunlight coming from all directions, uh, so long as it's coming from uh, above the, the surface of the land, because of course the sun is always at least somewhat above the horizon or right at the horizon. So the light can come, the, the lowest angle at which light can come in, uh, in air, of course, is, is totally horizontal. And it's, of course, you're talking about reflected light from a, a pool or something like that. Uh, but if we're talking about simple transmission of, of direct sunlight, not reflected, then it can come from any angle from zero degrees, basically up to 90 degrees uh, zenith. Uh, and that way you can get really interesting effects of highlight and shadows. In this case, we're dealing with sunlight coming from, you know, sort of not quite maybe noon, but high angle sunlight. So that's all we're worrying about. But that's important uh, for the way in which we're going to be generating sort of the, the, uh, the highlights on top of these, these sort of foamy bubbles, as well as the position of the, uh, the sort of the gleam or the, the, the flare uh, light uh, along shiny glossy surfaces like, for example, the dorsal fin uh, of the animal that has uh, reached the surface. Uh, somebody's asking, mm -hmm. oh, they were asking about the spelling of Snell's. Oh, Snell's Law. Snell's Law. S-N-E-L-L. -L. Snell. Snell's, Snell's Law. Law. Yeah, so S-E-N-N, S-E, oh, goodness, I oh, need coffee. Oh. S-N-E-L-L. Oh, if you actually got it right, I think. Oh, okay, good, good, yes. Okay, good. I don't, oh, okay, it must be another screen there, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So Snell's Law, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's the way. That's it, exactly, good. Um, so yeah, when you when you deal with Snell's Law, you can, you can apply it to how um, the way in which uh, light uh, coming from above or from below the water surface uh, interacts with the interface between air and water and at what points, at what angles uh, of impact to the surface based on incidence, it is either transmitted through and refracted or reflected uh, from the surface back. So then you get that, that sort of governs the, the appearance of the surface of the water from below as to whether you're seeing the sky through the, the water uh, air interface or a reflection of the um, underwater environment when you look at a low enough angle. Um, uh, along the, uh, the underside of the, of the air water interface. So uh, you get really neat sort of uh, ways in which you can determine how the undersurface of the waves should look like when you're at certain distances below it. 
Okay, so right now I've started uh, doing those those bubbles, but now I'm going to also add the the animal's dorsal fin. So for that, what I'm going to do is switch to a uh, a different darker uh, color, and once again, I'm going to use that black. So I'm actually going to take a little bit of the black itself. Uh, one other thing I, I forgot to mention, actually, before we do that, um, let me just go back to the the animal uh, that's underwater. Two things I forgot to mention that I should add to this. Uh, one of them is that the dorsal fin also has a white patch on it. Okay? So this white patch differs in shape a little bit between individuals and between populations, but roughly it is along the trailing edge of the dorsal fin and to varying distances forward along it. So this is another characteristic feature of Dow's porpoise. Okay. So this is a white patch up here. <sighs> yeah, I love working with these pastels. Just the way that you can paint them with these applicators is really satisfying. So fascinating. And I'm sure this camera captures mm -hmm. it a little better. Right? Mm -hmm. It looks beautiful. Thank you. You're it's, it's you're really able to capture like all the three dimensional aspects of it too, like all the shading. This that, is that's kind of the hope, yeah. And and the nice thing about this too is with these pastels, you can actually work with light colors on dark, as you can see. That was effectively black, and um, I was able to put this. It's actually not white. It's it's a it's a very very light gray, but it effectively works as as white here compared to the other colors. But it works. It still manages to sit on top of it effectively. The other thing that I forgot to mention there is that there's also a white margin along the posterior edge of the flukes, uh, and they go like this. So there's it starts out in the middle and it gets widest uh, toward the lateral edge, um, sort of the apex of the flukes, kind of like this. And so we have a bit of white here. And of course, this is going to, I want to maximize the brightness of this one because it is facing upward toward the surface where the light is coming from. So it's going to intercept the, the most sunlight, right? So it would look the brightest. Um, so I might have to adjust the brightness of the, the one on the, on the side of the dorsal fin, perhaps. There's also a lot of sort of light that's scattered by the water. And so some of the, the, the color, the, the tones of the animal is governed by that. You don't have as many um, sharp caustics on this animal. So there's not a, as much direct sunlight here um, as you would have in, say, like the scene with the orcas last time where we had some very sharp caustics um, and indi indicative of maybe some much brighter sunlight. Okay, so here we, here we have the sort of the, the white on the flukes along the posterior margin or the back edge of the flukes. And so that's basically where you would expect to find white on this animal. There's sometimes actually a little bit also along the posterior edge of the flippers, the, the uh, pectoral fin. So I'll just add a little bit of an edge along there. It varies from individual to individual to some extent. So, but this one will have a little bit there and it'll also help us to sort of define the edge of it a little bit. There we go, like that. And they have this slightly falcate or slightly hooked uh, pectoral fins or flippers as well. Um, also uh, kind of hooked dorsal fin, but but still leaning kind of forwards. Again, we talked about this before, really interesting shaped dorsal fin. So there we go. Add a few more highlights onto the caustics there, smeared out caustics, but that pretty much does it for the animal under the water. Uh, the only other exception might be that we wanted to maybe highlight some of the, the other bumpy areas with a very small amount of of highlights here, like above the eye. The eye is actually located on um, a, a, there's a bit of a bulge in the side of the head um, where the eye is located. Uh, so that bulge is, sh uh, shows up by being slightly highlighted along the top edge uh, where the eye sits. So you can actually see that a little bit when you look at the animal from the side like that. Okay, and then maybe you might see a little little trace of the edge of the mouth, but not much from this angle. So I'd say I'd call that one pretty much ready. Now we'll go again back to the one above the water there. And so as I mentioned, I'm going to use the, the black, uh, I want to say marker, the black uh, stick of, of pastel to just kind of give it a little bit of black. 
on the dorsal fin and then I'll spread it out with that applicator paintbrush like applicator to smooth it out a bit okay, so like this and then so uh, that dorsal fin and a little bit of the the back behind it is visible above the water just breaking the surface because again these porpoises unlike many dolphins don't do those acrobatic flips and breaches out of the water typically but rather they just have their upper uh, their dorsal side sort of just kind of breach the surface a little bit and often at very high speed so that's why you get these sort of bubbles and rooster tails generated as they pass by there's the rough uh, black pastel added and now I'm going to use this applicator to smooth it out Bring it a little closer to that camera there so you can see it and here we go now it's smoothing Oops. I try to get my hand not to interfere too much with the view. <laughs> I'm a lefty, so we kind of have to take that into account when we position the cameras. Well, we have enough cameras to well, we like do. one yeah. <laughs> one angle is going to capture yeah, exactly. the right thing. This is good. Yeah, it's it's actually I really enjoy this setup. It's working quite well. And then with the pigment I still have left on the applicator, I'm going to spread some of it out backward from the dorsal fin. So we're seeing some of the animal below the surface of the water, but a little bit fainter because some, we're looking at this, this water at an angle and because of Snell's law, only some of the light from below is transmitted through and a lot more is reflected from above the water. So we're looking at reflection of the sky to a large extent and that interferes with images from below the surface. So we're only seeing the porpoise like sort of partly transmitted, the image of the porpoise partly transmitted through the water surface and more so at the very shallow bits and less so the deeper it goes. Also because the, the light is, is less, um, it's less, it's less lit up but there's more to look through, more water to look through basically to get to the lower parts of the porpoise. And the other thing to remember is when we're looking at, a, at an any object through the water at an angle um, as opposed to directly downward. Remember that the water distorts the appearance of objects in it. And so if you've ever done that, you know, that sort of um, elementary school uh, demonstration of uh, the pencil dipped into a cup of water and how you look at it from above and it looks like the pencil is bent right at the interface of the, of the water uh, and air. It's because, of course, the, the refraction of light by water as, as the light passes through that interface causes, causes that to, to the, the image to bend effectively. And so um, it doesn't just bend, but it squishes the appearance of objects that are below the surface when viewed from above. So we have to keep that in mind. When we draw the porpoise under the surface, the image of the porpoise when viewed through the water surface will look vertically squashed. So it'll look thinner than the one underwater okay, in an up and down way. So it actually only goes that far down. Okay, so other elements of optics, important um, uh, phenomena and, and, and principles to keep in mind when we're, when we're illustrating, uh, when we're drawing and painting these porpoises that are partially above and partially below the water like that. So you can see that some of it is visible, but not as starkly as the one we're looking at here. And the only reason we can see this one so well and so undistorted is because we're imagining that there's a pane of glass that is uh, standing with the water uh, coming up. It's like it's like the like the wall of the glass wall of an aquarium. Basically, you can see above the water, and you can see below the water, and you can see the water line. And when you look at water this way, there's no, you don't have that bending that happens at the surface. Um, in the same way if you're looking at it straight through, which is what we're effectively doing here. If you look at it at an angle, you will see some bending, but you'll also see different kind of bending depending on the optical properties of the glass itself. So then the water, the, the, the light will be bent in different ways depending on the index of refraction of the glass, uh, the glass air interface, 
um, or the, the, the relative index of refraction of the air, the glass, and the water. And so all of those together will generate a different kind of a, a distortion of image compared to looking at the image straight through the surface of water at an angle. Wonderfully complex physics. <laughs> but once you get familiar with it, you can use it pretty effectively, repeatedly, because if you learn a few rules and you keep applying them consistently, you generate much more realistic looking images. And now I'm going to add the, remember that beautiful white area on the side of the porpoise, um, but we're gonna see it from above the water, so we're actually gonna see it a little bit less distinct than we do on this one. The other thing to keep in mind here is notice there's a difference in shape of the dorsal fin of this one than this one. The dorsal fin here, and we can tell because they're both um, undistorted, right? This one because we're looking at it through the glass effectively, and this one here because it's above the water. The reason for that is this is a female. Females have uh, a lower dorsal fin than the males typically, uh, less of a pronounced uh, um, sort of vertical dorsal fin and less of that forward bent, strange straight front edge of a dorsal fin that is so characteristic of, of the adult male Dallas porpoise. And, so. and for the males, that is even more pronounced during the mating season. Oh, for that's some reason, that actually changes properties. That. Yeah, it's it's particularly wow. pronounced during the mating season. That is really amazing. See, this is the other thing, is that we're used to certain animals, like birds, changing their plumage, the color of their plumage, sometimes the shape of the feathers, too, in mating season. And, you know, we think, well, that's, that's yeah, different pigments, and different feathers are grown, and so on, that makes sense. But some animals change the shape and size of other soft tissues as well, not just things like, you know, skin components, uh, integument like feathers, but the actual size and shape of certain parts of their body can really change substantially from one season to the next. I think that's fascinating. So next time I'm I'm gaining a little a little weight, I'm just <laughs> gonna say that's just just my soft tissue is changing um, due go. to the season. <laughs> it's just the seasonal it's thing. It's just yeah. the seasonal thing. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. It's got nothing to do with the food we yeah. consume yeah, certain times go. of yeah. the year. Yeah. Just avoid the guilt. It's fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I'm doing here is uh, instead of using the that very very light, almost white, I'm using a very light blue. This is actually. Um, this is called phthalo blue tint uh, in this particular pan pastel. It's this little guy here. Any, it's a very light blue. Any mention of phthalo blue brings me back to Bob Ross right away. Oh, <laughs> of course, yes. It's one of those very uh, important uh, types of, of, of blue to be using. This phthalo blue, phthalo green as well. Uh, anyway, this one is a little bit bluer than, than the one I used for the porpoise underwater because, again, we're looking through the water here, and there's also a little bit of an effect of the, the, the sort of the tint that the water gives it. And so we're getting a little bit less um, uh, stark white here. And this is intended to make it look more realistic. Again, we really have to consider the environment in which any of the organisms are that we're painting. Uh, because we want the maximum accuracy not to use kind of like just you know logic of what we think a porpoise should look like but paying attention to how that form is influenced by the environment the, the optical environment in which it exists in this case whether it's above water or below water how far below water how much water we're having to look through to see it um, things like that. And, and at what angle, you know, how much of it we see compared to the reflections of the sky above it, for example. That's another reason why it's nice to have this blue background for the, like the blue paper that I've selected, because we can use that uh, as the basis for some of the reflection also of the, the sky above it. And we can modify that as well by adding, and I'll show you that as well as we finish this up, uh, to show some of the surface uh, reflections uh, depending on the wave structure. <laughs> We're having fun with the cameras as well in the meantime. Marcus is hovering above me, um, uh, optimizing the position of the cameras, and uh, we're... Uh we're dealing with physics here. Yes, we're dealing with real physics in a different way. Uh, this is all so that we can give you the, 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 the best sort of, the best possible uh, broadcast of this, trying to control as many factors as possible, which is uh, not always easy. <laughs> Not easy. So yeah, uh, 
Uh, thumbs up to him for the efforts he put into the studio because it's really quite something. I'm always amazed at the setup here. Uh, what I'm doing here as well is at the front edge of the porpoise. Uh, when the porpoise comes to the surface at high speed, it does two things. When it actually intersects the, the surface of the water, uh, it can generate this bit of turbulence that we see here, these bubbles. But just before that happens, the, the pressure of, of the, the front end of the porpoise, of its rostrum and its, uh, the melon, or the part of the forehead of the animal, pushes the water upward a little bit out of the way. And before it actually um, breaks up into bubbles, there is the, the water actually piles for a while. It piles up into this bit of a, a gentle curve up the front of it. And so that is made visible by the way in which it reflects the light from above differently depending on the angle of that, that bow wave. That's exactly what it is, the bow wave that's created by the porpoise. The same way that a ship slicing through the water pushes the water forward ahead of it and creates a bow wave on which porpoises and dolphins actually have fun surfing. And so porpoises and dolphins create their own bow waves. And that's what we see at the front end of the animal, front end of the animal just before it goes into turbulence and bubbles uh, after it breaks the surface. You suggested I wish we should use another level. I should show what this setup actually looks like. Yeah, you there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is everything from uh, seeing from, uh, yeah, and I've got this really interesting square head here. Um, <laughs> That's what Judas really looks yeah, like. Is, the rest is, is CGI. Actually, yeah, the other one is just like a Photoshop uh, um, augmented reality, but this is me. I'm really a machine inside. Um, yeah, <laughs> photographic evidence. This is Photoshop and, and other kinds of augmented it reality. It looks so it's realistic, real. though. It's it so makes realistic. me fit in better with the rest of the species, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, it helps. It's, yeah, it's a few things we need to do for social acceptance. People with square yeah. blinking heads usually... It, it doesn't go over it well in all situations, well. strangely. All situations, it gives me yeah. troubles at the bank and places like that, it's, so people like to see faces. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so here we go. So this porpoise has just begun to break the surface. So we're not going to create a long trail of bubbles behind it because it's just broken the surface. So remember that, right? You want to keep in mind what you're illustrating, what has already happened. If this porpoise has been cruising through the surface with the rooster tail for a long time, then yeah, we would have this wake of bubbles behind it where that initial sort of turbulence that it's generated has been going on for some time. Um, oh, cool. And, <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, on the other hand, this porpoise has only just broken the surface, so we only have a few bubbles following it. Uh, and then those basically, where they begin, uh, indicates where it first break, broke the surface and it's moved slightly forward from there. But it only goes back a certain distance. And I, I was just getting into your personal space because I, I adjusted your screen so you can see Excellent. the live broadcast, including questions that we have. Oh, well, I There's... see. Yes, this is good. Yes, because I, I couldn't read it at that distance away, but now I can actually see that. Um, yeah, well, thank you for the uh, for the the compliments from the audience there as well. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you have the question. Uh, you have questions on the lower left of the screen of the actual broadcast. Can you see it? Um, it says question? it's underneath to the left of your own picture. There it says oh, is I the yes. dorsal mm. fin cavernous tissue of some sort. <laughs> That's an interesting tissue. question. Um, okay. I'm not actually familiar with that term here. I probably should be, uh, but I'm not actually. Um, could you clarify that? I mean, we could just do a quick search as well, but um, cavernous tissue, uh, yeah, I think that you've kind of, you've, you've, you've breached my, my knowledge. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what that's supposed to mean on, either. On. Uh, maybe you can, you can give us a little bit more detail there. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, it's a good question. It, would, it sounds like it would be a fascinating question to answer, which I'd like to see the answer to that one as well. Uh, We're all learning here. <laughs> cavernous meaning it has voids in it to be filled okay, with air sense. or fluid. Oh, okay. So partially sort of hollow at some levels uh, at the cellular level. He, he, writes, sure. he, writes, he writes like a sponge. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Okay, uh, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Um, I'm not sure. This is something that we would have to look into. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. 
as I add some highlights to the bubbles here, you also notice that, or we will notice that um, the upper parts of some of these wet, like water is wet, uh, and any kind of these bulges of bubbles along the, the leading edge of this turbulent region are very wet, and wet things tend to be glossy. Uh, and glossy things uh, reflect these, these uh, what are called specular um, highlights, uh, these sort of flares, or uh, what we like to, what we notice as in our eyes, those little bright spots where we reflect the image of the sun in our eyes, for example. Those are specular highlights. And so you have some of those kinds of things happening on the surface of these bubbles as they bend in certain ways where they're able to reflect the sun from above in a more specular rather than sort of a diffuse sort of reflection that happens. So that's why you get some of these really bright areas. And that's why you have foam that is, is bright basically because you get all those specular highlights adding up in all of the bubbles uh, and, and generating this overall sort of whiteness. Uh, so that's just a feature of um, it being water, of being sort of wet, a glossy surface. And so now comes the part that is a characteristic of the douse porpoise uh, moving rapidly through the water surface. And that is, sorry, my arm is in the way, is the generation of that sort of rooster tail of water that happens, that sort of comes off the trailing edge of the dorsal fin. Even the smaller dorsal fin of the females uh, is definitely large enough to create this kind of an effect. Um, and uh, females and young males as well. So I mean a lot of the time young males will look similar to adult females in their shape or coloration. This happens in many animals from birds to cetaceans. And here we have um, the, the dorsal fin. I'm going to create this kind of a, an arc um, of water that's sprayed up, that's been guided by the dorsal fin, by the leading edge of the dorsal fin and basically creates a rooster tail of spray after it. And these sprays are really neat in the way that they're shaped. Um, so that's, the, that's one line along the top, but they often come in several steps. So you have an interesting complexity. We talked, I think last time, a little bit about the interesting ways in which water um, uh, I think we talked about it, how water uh, works when it, when it splashes. Actually, there, there are, I guess maybe I'm confusing it with other programs we've also done. Because last time it was mostly underwater. It was an underwater scene that we saw entirely. In this case, we have this little bit that's above water as well. And we're illustrating the, our, our very typical rooster tail um, of water that's sprayed back. And so there's the interesting complexity, like when water when water drips down from something, if, if you were to look at your tap, for example, you run your tap uh, and, and you, you, you let it kind of go from low to high setting, uh, there will be different levels of turbulence. And so at some point you might get this nice smooth line of water. But if you, if you intercept it with your finger and move it up and down, then you'll notice that as it hits your finger, um, it kind of looks like it's, it's created of several droplets. Um, it's really interesting how that is, how it separates into droplets and, and appears to fuse in our view into a single stream. Um, when you have a high-speed camera capture some of these streams of water that come off the, the, the dolphin's uh, or the porpoise's fin, for example, you'll notice that the water stream is actually composed of these beads of water effectively strung together not just a single solid line. And this is something that we want to pay attention to when we're illustrating it. Uh, water, when, it, when it, it flows through the air, tends to kind of, because of surface tension, because of its, its cohesive uh, properties, it tends to try to, not behaviorally, but effectively, because of its physics, it, it ends up uh, coalescing as much as it can. So larger chunks will, will be drawn to each other. And so there will be areas where it tends to coalesce and areas where it's moving away from those regions. And then that ends up creating these drops of water, uh, like a string of beads. And that's what we see developing in the rooster tail. Uh, at the beginning, it may be a relatively solid line, but the further back we go, 
the more it breaks up into these sort of blobs of water. And this is important for us if we're illustrating um, any kind of, of splashing activity, is that when water is splashed from a surface, um, from a pool, for example, those, uh, the water that lifts off from it will tend to break up uh, in various ways. And sometimes you might have like an entire sort of hemisphere of water start out. And then as it thins, uh, surface tension takes over and draws the water into clumps. And then that ends up uh, forming, if you were to look at this slow motion, this networks, uh, basically, uh, the way that the water coalesces into these beads and rivulets uh, from this initial hemisphere of, of water that's come off the surface, for example. And anytime you get any kind of lines of water, let's say if you splash down with your boot into a puddle, sometimes you'll liberate entire columns of water and that column will stretch out and, and form these beads, basically. And this is what is important to keep in mind when we illustrate basically a snapshot um, of, of life or of, of, of something happening with, with water is uh, like here we start to see these kinds of um, the water breaking up into uh, globs and droplets. The further back we go, the smaller these droplets are uh, as it's broken up into smaller and smaller pieces. And some of the time you have these initial um, lines that it started with preserved to some extent as those water globs and droplets take on, uh, you know, move along their own trajectory under the influence of gravity and um, wind resistance or air resistance as wind, uh, the passage of the animal through the air itself and the, the kinds of um, air currents it, uh, its, its components generate will influence that stream of water. So again, more wonderful physics that's involved in creating the shape of these uh, rooster tails that are generated by Dow's porpoise as they uh, intercept the surface of the water with their dorsal fin. Okay. So, and then of course, as that water is thrown up and inter uh, interacts with air currents, different bits of it will fall out uh, in different places. And so we're getting have kind of ultimately a further back, we go with a, more and more of a mess of droplets as they're landing back, rejoining the surface of the ocean, basically. So it's important, again, in artwork to keep in mind this irregularity that happens. A lot of the time in biology and in, you know, in, in nature, things don't happen with mathematical precision in maintaining form all the way. You have a lot of irregularity. Many processes are overlaid on each other and these all interact and generate an overall uh, much messier look of things than we might expect just if we were considering just a few of those processes acting alone. And this is what happens uh, to create the landscapes that we see and the, the way in which uh, water drops land, um, for example. So that's what we're having happening here. Of course, all the way along the back edge of this dorsal fin, water is basically um, coming off it. And so here we have a little bit coming off from the bottom parts, a lot of it from the tip of the fin, uh, and it all kind of comes off in these combination of um, you know, these rivulets uh, and gaps in between them and so on. So yeah, it's a very interesting complex. And this is where uh, the mathematical uh, discipline of chaos theory um, is really well illustrated and how you have such complexity generated in the structure of this uh, water streams that um, come off the back end of the dorsal fin. And small changes in, in anybody who's familiar with Jurassic Park, of course, will, you know, will realize that sort of an echoing Ian Malcolm's character kind of thing of uh, how tiny changes in initial conditions will result in complex uh, uh, outcomes, basically, that are very diverse and often don't repeat themselves. And yeah, it's true, chaos is really a wonderful component, uh, a process that generates, or a series of processes, basically, that generate 
complexity in our natural world. Uh, seeing water drops land is an excellent uh, way to m make its, its presence visible. So there we go, there's the rooster tail, uh, and this is the, a bunch of that turbulence that's happening just as the animal uh, surfaces. What we're going to do now is add a little bit more uh, reflection to the surface of the water uh, to show, to sort of, um, uh, what's the word, I guess, um, uh, my, my brain needs coffee here <laughs> to kind of uh, I'll, convey. I'll work on the catering for episode <laughs> yeah, three. To convey the shape of the waves on the surface, basically, uh, based on the way in which they reflect the skies. So here we see the edge of this wave here. So I'm just going to outline the edge of the, of the surface of the water here. So imagine we have this glass um, wall intercepting intersecting the, the, the wall of water behind it. And then below it, we have the underwater scene and above it is the above water scene. And above it, we're looking down on the surface of the water. And here you can see the shapes of the waves, uh, some of the waves. There's gonna be some different sizes as well, but a few of the waves there. So what we're gonna do now is add some of the uh, smoother uh, or depending on the complexity of the of, of the waves that are present, uh, reflections to the surface to convey the shapes of these waves. So for one thing, we're going to have uh, these larger waves conveyed by, imagine that the light is coming sort of from here, from sort of the front of the animal, more of that light. It might be overcast, it might be mostly sunny, um, but because it's very smooth water relatively, we're going to have this kind of smoother reflection happening here, and more of it from the front end of the wave, which is positioned so that we're seeing uh, whatever is the brighter part of the sky reflected back toward our eyes from that angle. Okay. And I'm moving in sort of two directions here when I lay down the pigments. I'm not adding much pigment to the brush because already some of it in there from when I was creating the bubbles and the spray so I'm just kind of using the residual of that because we really don't want much of it here because we want a very nice smooth gradient for the light. Uh, some of it I am you know, adding sort of in a side to side motion following the, the angle of the surface of the wave. And then afterwards, I'm also going sort of in a perpendicular direction to that to smooth that out a little bit cross-cutting some of those lines that were initially generated. I don't really want the lines there. And remember also that the waves aren't all linear. They aren't all pile up in the same way maybe. In the ocean you have waves that kind of come from all different directions and, and when they inter interact with each other you have what's called constructive and destructive interference. When two waves meet their amplitudes, their heights will add up and so when they meet they generate a taller wave and when a wave meets a trough they cancel each other out. And so you have waves coming from all different directions and that creates this sort of mishmash of water that's oscillating up and down in different areas. Not necessarily all in, in like rows and neat rows. When you throw a pebble into the water, those leading edges of those ripples are smooth. They are still nice and, um, and linear basically, but curved, but curvilinear. Uh, but that's because they haven't interacted with many other waves yet. And you have one main drop into the water creating a single series of, of leading edges of waves. But if you were to drop a bunch of pebbles in at the same time, you would notice that all of these concentric circles would meet at different positions. And what would happen is that you would have a very complex um, a series of waves, uh, of more conical waves form on the surface. And that's what's happening in the ocean. You can actually see that happening in the, uh, the breaching humpback behind me. All that water in front of it is very, very complex in shape. That's because it's the sum of all the waves of all different sizes coming from all different directions, meeting and interacting with each other and constructively interfering, therefore adding together for crests and destructively interfering where one wave and one trough cancel each other out to make a flat spot. More physics. It, people seem to be fascinated by the physics. There's a lot of people commenting on the physics oh, as well, which excellent. is way above me. Uh, um, physics is not really my thing. Physics is fun, you know, when, when it's, you know, when you can get enough of an understanding of some of it so for it be, to become sort of a little bit second nature, it's so fun. 
Uh, I, I love working with that and that's what allows me attention to these details is what allows me to make as realistic uh, images as possible. So for example here let's say we have a wave that is a little bit more conical that kind of stands on its own because it's the result of several waves coming together in just such a way that it creates a local uh, maximum uh, of constructive interference, right? And then the, the, there are others. And remember we mentioned before that the leading edge of the bow wave generated by that Dallas porpoise there is basically a wave as well. Okay? So that's also reflecting in a similar way. This wave here lines up with the one at the very edge of our imaginary glass wall. But then it kind of peters out toward the Dells porpoise, giving, rise, uh, giving way to other waves in different positions. Add a little bit of dark there. So sometimes I will recharge a little bit of the, um, of the pigments uh, and then spread those out. If you just have a look at the screen at that comment there, uh, mm -hmm. your little screen. Oh, yes. The bow. Oh, <laughs> the Bob Ross of Fluid Dynamics. Yes, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, kind of like the Bob Ross of Fluid Dynamics. Bob Ross, yeah, he, he was fun in many ways. He had so many neat things to say. I, I've only seen some of the episodes. I still have a lot more of them to see. But he had some great little additions to say. You know, I mean, if we were to do that, then I could be talking about the little happy waves that we generate here. The happy you know. waves. Yeah. I, I, I always liked it when he when he used to say that you know there are no mistakes yes. because he was working with acrylic he was just you know over painting it but really encouraging people to just try and yeah not be discouraged by yep the little mishaps that may happen yeah and you can make your little accidents turn into other things for example if I were to make a, you know too much um, brightness there maybe it could be a sharper wave crest for example uh, generated by maybe another douse porpoise, uh, you know, flapping its tail at the surface or whatever, and then we have a little bit of a sharper wave or something. You know, there's various kinds of things you can do, or, or the, the top edge of the wave is, is brighter, for example. Um, all sorts of things can happen. When you're dealing with the ocean surface, it's a really dynamic place. You get all kinds of things happening. So we might also have a few smaller uh, little waves that are overlaid, superimposed onto the longer smooth waves. And if that happens, then we have a more complex surface. Uh, and a lot more of these individual little highlights at a much smaller scale. And, and just, yeah. just remember one question that we had earlier that, that I didn't actually pass on. Uh, we've now revealed that at least one of them is a female, but uh, they wanted to know if we're looking at a juvenile or if these mm -hmm. are adults. Like, oh, yeah, right. Uh, it's a good question. That's right. Exactly. Because yeah, well, now we have covered the fact that, yeah, the one on the bottom is a male. Um, I wanted to show that because I wanted to show the really weird dorsal fin and the body shape, which is, uh, as Marcus was saying, is especially pro uh, pronounced during uh, breeding season. Um, and kind of like the way that, you know, how sockeye salmon, when they are spawning, get this really hooked jaws. Um, these secondary sexual characteristics that appear uh, are, are massive ways in which the tissue changes in configuration. And some of that kind of thing happens with Dallas porpoise as well. And so, yeah, so that's the male uh, under the water there and right at the interface between the water and the surface in the background, making the super fast rooster tail is the female. Or, or it could be a young male, uh, but, you know, let's call that one the female or one of, a female. Uh, by the way, these, these Dallas porpoise will travel in different sized groups too. So sometimes they uh, occur in just a few individuals. Actually, that was really nice in the video earlier, showing them riding the bow wave of the boat. You could see, I don't know how many we counted, it was probably under 10 or somewhere around there. But sometimes they will group, and, and, and their, their, their group sizes vary a lot as well. They can be quite fluid. But sometimes they can come together in groups of hundreds or even thousands of individuals, these super pods. Uh, so, they are very fluid and they come together and split apart. Um, sort of different, I guess, than some of the s more stable-sized pods of some other cetaceans, like even some of the orcas that we talked about last week, uh, or last time, that um, I think they have a lot more stable-sized pods at any given time, although I could be wrong about that. But what we do know is that, is that um, yeah, there we go, the Dallas porpoise here can form different sized pods and they can be quite fluid. 
it's just so neat to watch them um, just torpedo through the water at high speed and you can just really get a feel of how fast they can swim imagine these traveling at city cruising speeds of uh you know 50 kilometers per hour they can do that and in water but you can see here when you look down on them look how narrow their body is especially at the near the flukes how incredibly narrow but yet how tall or how deep their body is so you can see how the cross section is very complex depending on where on the animal we're looking they're sort of thicker fatter toward the front and narrower at the back. This is a classic sort of tuniform shape, um, tuniform referring to the, the shape of a tuna, kind of torpedo shaped, um, that kind of tapers backward. And this is an optimum shape for hi, uh, hydrodynamic efficiency for fast moving animals underwater. Tuna, uh, mackerel sharks like uh, great whites and makos, uh, a lot of these fast swimming animals, uh, swordfish, they all have this kind of tuniform shape. It's uh, something that has been selected because it ends up being the, the, the most efficient shape for, for reducing the drag on, at the surface of the animal uh, through the water and therefore allowing more of its uh, input energy to be transformed into propulsive power forward rather than shed as waste energy into creating a lot of turbulent eddies around the animal. I'm so fascinated by how much energy is involved, right? Oh, when you, as, yeah. as you're watching this video and you see these right. animals, just with, maybe I can play this video again. Uh, if you just pay attention to the, to the fluke, how little movement they, right. they actually, point. there's, if you, if you watch the fluke, they will accelerate, but then at some point they've reached that speed and they'll just barely move their fluke and still they're this fast. It's really amazing how efficient their shape is for moving through the water. They require so, yeah, so little energy to generate um, a given amount of uh, speed. And uh, then when you realize how much muscle they have in their body, it makes sense that they can travel so fast through the water when you add those two factors together. It's really beautiful to see that. You see this in sharks too, is that they kind of flick their tail a little bit and they're just like power forward suddenly in this burst of speed, um, certain species especially, and especially those ones that, as I was saying, have this sort of typical tuniform shape. Uh, those ones are optimized for rapid travel through the water. And you can, you can like clearly see the rooster tail now in the, in yeah, there the, you go. In the animal on top. Yeah. So I'm adding a few waves here and there just evidenced by the way that the reflection brightness changes at the surface here and there. And then you kind of refine them as you go. And one of our viewers comments, 50 kilometers per hour is just shy of 27 knots, which is faster than most commercial ships can travel. That's impressive. So that actually makes sense that they're able to, to chase down ships and ride their bowies because they actually have to first get to the ship, right? And yeah. if the ship is faster than them, it will outrun them and they won't have a chance to ride the bow wave. But if they can outspeed the ship, then they can, they can come up alongside the ship, find the bow, and then start riding the wave there. Yeah, one user is actually asking, is that the speed for hunting or for migrating? Oh, that's a good question. And yeah, I think it's the top speed. Top speed yeah. is actually 55 kilometers I an think so, hour. yeah, that's what I remember too. Yeah, 55. Um, so usually they're, well, I don't know what proportion of the time they spend at, at, at what speeds below that. But, you know, you got to keep in mind that these animals also want to conserve energy. Uh, you know, when they're hunting, they may have to be fast because they need to catch fast prey. Some of the fish that they eat are really fast moving, like herring, for example. Uh, so they need to be able to chase down their prey. But uh, in between those bouts of speed, they probably want to conserve their energy as much as possible because, of course, there is no free lunch, as my uh, master's advisor always used to tell us in his ecology uh, lessons. And uh, we have to expend energy to be able to get our lunch in the first place. And we don't want to run out of that energy before we get enough energy to replace it. And better yet, to, uh, to have enough left over for growth and reproduction and everything else that life demands. So that's right. They, especially marine mammals, since they since they need to dive as well, they have to sort of take that into account as well, right? Everything Good that point. they do, there's a purpose to it, there's or a, a purpose. A purpose to uh, it. Uh, <laughs> we have to we have to put the addition the oh, the, the occasional purpose oh, puns course, in there. Um, but yeah, the, 
bust rate and exactly. whether you're gonna go after you know they, they eat schooling fish so if you have like a very small group of just two or three you know fishies they may not like decide to to chase them down yeah. and really expend that energy whereas uh, or especially if they go are uh, going after something that's <laughs> deeper in the water right they're not going to want to uh, expend that energy if it's not worth it so there, there's yeah. a little bit of thinking that goes on there there is and this is where um the principle in ecology known as uh, or, or basically this kind of a process known as optimal foraging theory comes in uh it's basically the the tenet is that organisms will tend to select the foods, the sources of food that require the least energetic input to acquire. And so that will alter a lot of the time their feeding behavior. So if you have a ton of slow moving fish here and a few fast moving fish here, uh, it'll take a lot less energy, uh, net energetic cost to uh, get the bunch of, you know, have access to a lot of slow moving fish that won't take much energy to catch because they're slower moving and you have an abundance of them. Uh, so you can replace a lot of your energy, your, your expended energy rapidly. So you should go for the bunch of slower moving fish rather than the few fast moving ones. And when those ones are no longer available, if you've eaten all of them, then you go for the next best, the next least uh, energetically expensive meal, basically. And that's how uh, organisms tend to work. Uh, and this sort of principle is, is optimal foraging theory in ecology. And you do see that a lot. And, and, and of course, that shapes the evolution of many things, including the body shape of these animals. Uh, there are limits on the availability of all of these foods. And so some of them are so limited by, by slow moving food that, you know, it's, it's eaten up very quickly maybe, that they actually have to spend a lot more time chasing down fast prey. And therefore, those descendants, those offspring that have the, the, the best um, traits for moving quickly through water are going to be the ones that end up uh, doing the best. And they will most likely be the ones that will pass on their genes to the next generation because they'll have higher reproductive success on average. And that's how evolution works. That's how natural selection works. You get an increasing proportion uh, of certain traits uh, that are inherited uh, in subsequent generations because those traits uh, allowed for the organisms bearing them to have greater reproductive success. It's just a wonderful sort of a, a feedback situation. That's all that evolution really is. I mean, there, there, are, there are really fascinating details of it, but in the end, that's how natural selection works. So apart from, uh, from physics uh, and a little bit of chemistry, I think we had earlier, mm -hmm. we're, adding, we're adding some evolutionary biology yeah. to yeah. the mix. Yeah, it's so fun to see these different patterns. And sometimes you look at certain traits and you wonder, wow, why were some of those selected for? In some cases, certain traits of animals may have been selected by uh, environments in which their ancestors lived that no longer are present. And so you have these sort of leftover vestigial traits that are left over from a time when they were beneficial to, uh, to be possessed. Uh, but no longer are, and it takes a while for some of these traits to be lost because they're not actively selected for anymore. And, and when we say a while on an evolutionary right. <laughs> scale, we mean like a really long while. Millions of years a lot of the time, uh, usually. And sometimes, like for example, uh, there, you know, a really good example is, is our vestigial tail, the, our tail bones. Uh, which are coccyx, which are basically fused tailbones and which we can still unfortunately break sometimes if we <laughs> land on them too hard. We, some people have done that, know how painful that is. They're still there. They don't actually serve the function of a tail anymore, uh, such as balance, for example, or propulsion, depending on, depending on the animal, uh, or sometimes even predator evasion, like in lizards that can lose their tail and regrow it, uh, acting as a way to uh, distract their uh, potential predator, would-be predator, uh, while they escape. So many different uses for tails, but in us, it's vestigial at this point. They're anchor points for certain uh, muscles as well, uh, but they're also really not used for a lot else. 
and uh, you know we've lost most of the function, most of the size and complexity of the tail of other animals, for which a tail was a strong uh, benefit to have in their particular niche or sort of like the way of life that they live. So that's a good example. In, in whales, uh, hind limbs uh, are another example that was lost. So early whales had four limbs uh, and then the further along you go uh, past the point at which whales first evolved, the smaller these hind limbs get because more efficient for the flukes that were generated to be used as the main propulsion mode and the hind limbs were just kind of dragged along and the front limbs are used mostly for steering. And so those second set of limbs were not useful enough to be actively selected for and they were gradually lost um, over many millions of years. And the early whales that were already fully aquatic, like the, um, the Bacillosaurids, for example, you can still see the hind limbs present, but they're very, very small, vestigial. And nowadays, whales still uh, possess bones for some of their hind limbs, uh, but they're no longer visible uh, as an external feature. So you can see the evidence of long periods of evolution. Um, in some cases, like with flukes that have been actively selected for and that were very well developed, and in some cases where selection for them has stopped uh, over the years and all that's left is the small vestigial structures. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in another quick comment because mm -hmm. this is interesting and it also gets me to, to talk about something else. Um, this is a saying, diagrams of early whales are crazy, so they're so fun to look at. Mm -hmm. um, the, which brings me to, to your actual profession. Uh, right. Mainly these days, you're, you're a scientific illustrator, so you very yeah. much do illustrate animals that are very much still around. You can actually see in the mm -hmm. wild, as we're doing right now with mm -hmm. adults purpose, but you're a paleo artist, That's so right. you... Most of my bread and butter comes from uh, working to uh, reconstruct images of what prehistoric animals and plants and other life forms would have looked like when they were alive. And uh, the reason I do this is because paleontologists and paleobotanists who uh, work to understand how these prehistoric life forms looked and lived uh, wish to convey to their audience what they may have looked like when they were alive. And since we can't go and photograph these anymore because, well, they're fossilized and they're long dead, <laughs> uh, we need the help of people who have the, the skills and the background uh, to be able to depict them in uh, their hypothesized um, living form. Not just hypothesized, but really in many ways, um, uh, a lot of study has gone into what they likely look like in many different ways, from the way in which the bones inter uh, uh, came together and articulated, to the shape of their, their soft tissues and their integument, to even in some cases, aspects of their color. Uh, all of these kinds of things are, 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 are fascinating bits of the natural world that paleontologists uh, study, and paleo artists are hired by them to uh, often depict what they look like what they likely looked like to the best of our knowledge, based on all of the available evidence, uh, when they were alive. And that's basically what I do for a living most of the time. So yeah, that's definitely uh, ancient whales is something that I have covered and I am actually covering actively right now some of my artwork. It's a lot of fun to be able to uh, work out these images of, of what they likely looked like when they were alive and what they were doing, you know, all these kinds of things. Behavior is an important part of paleo, paleo art as well. I mean, we have we have so many things to, to potentially cover still because um, mm -hmm. this is just episode two out of, I don't know, 5,000. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> we expect to have long lives. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. Let's live long enough to live forever, right? <laughs> no, let's think more sustainably. But, uh, but yeah, hopefully we get a lot of episodes out of this. That would be nice. I and, enjoy that. And what I wanted to say with that is, like, eventually we might actually get into some paleo art yeah, as well, yeah, right? But, I mean, some of it is very pertinent to a lot of what we're talking about anyway. Yeah. So I can certainly bring in some of it to show at times when it's most effective to bring up into conversation. Uh, because a lot of well, what we're talking about right now is the evolution of some of these features that allow the porpoise to swim so fast. 
Um, so for sure. Yeah. So we're getting close to finished here, you know, or, or what I would consider finished. But one thing that I did miss, remember the the white patches on the dorsal fin that um, showed up on the male. There's also uh, some of that on the female, maybe a little bit less pronounced. So it's a little bit smaller, but it's there. So I'm going to add that here as well. And I'm going to use the brighter, nearly white color because it's above the water. So we can actually see that without the water getting in the way. So there, there's that one. And maybe a little bit of white along the trailing edge of the flukes as well underwater, like this. There we go. Okay. So that kind of gives it some of the color. Okay. And in a few places, maybe there might be a, you know, this is where it gets interesting. You can kind of add a little bit of variety to the water. So some places there may have been little drops of water and so here and there you might get little concentric circles where uh, water has dripped from let's say the rooster tail or whatever or or some other mammal you know another um, dallas porpoise passing before and so some of these concentric circles of ripples are have grown in size already you know the idea is to remember that that the natural world is irregular in many ways try not to be too regular in depicting things. Throw in a few little weird bits of things. And so here, like a specular highlight on a wave. Maybe there's a local bit of um, you know, constructive interference at a small scale. These things happen. There's a lot to happy little waves. Yeah, a lot of happy little waves, exactly. Yeah, things like that. So all kinds of stuff. Um, and, you know, if we had lots of time, I could go in and add a lot more detail to it. But um, I'm getting very close to calling this one almost finished now because we don't want to add too much detail to the surface because we don't want to upstage the foreground so we don't want to get the background too too detailed too interesting because that'll detract attention from some of our foreground animals which are really kind of the stars of the show here um, so i'm going to also add a few little beams of light coming through and highlight therefore the edge of the water I'm so curious if, if any of our viewers are actually going to try and uh, and copy mm -hmm. some of this. That would be interesting to see some of them um, on, you know, if, if you can send them in or something. And yeah, kind of if, if you want to take our got. social media channels or yeah. just submit comments, I, yeah. would, I would love to to know if, if, if some of you are actually um, yeah. attempting this. I always keep saying, like, whenever we talk about this, I always say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck at the stick porpoise level. That is about <laughs> how much artistic talent I have. But um, there, there are a lot of very talented uh, people among Indeed. our viewers. So I would love to know if, if one of you is trying this out. And you can, mm -hmm. we had this question earlier, uh, can we watch uh, the previous episodes and is there going to be an archive of all those episodes? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can yep. uh, search for the Porpoise Conservation Society on YouTube. Uh, every episode ends up there permanently archived for eternity. And we also create uh, highlights on our uh, Twitch channels as well. So if you're watching the Porpoise Conservation Society or Marine Mammal Rescue on Twitch, then you can find all those uh, older episodes there as well. Canvas and Current's coloring book. Ooh, ah. hey, that's a good idea. I like that. I have created um, a series of coloring sheets uh, of various kinds of um, of animals and plants uh, in the past, and have either done them for certain of these hydro draw programs or just sort of independently. It would be really interesting to do a one featuring the animals that we have um, featured on this uh, on this series. That's a neat right? idea. I like that. Like yeah, I find that I find that data really interesting that's too. Thanks idea. for those comments. Yeah, that's I, I'm, I'm sure they were half joking about this, but honestly, well, I don't this... know. I mean, uh, that is really great, and and also because a lot of the the viewers uh, are or have kids, and uh, as a kid, I loved coloring, and this is an an excellent way to learn about wildlife and our our natural world. Or as as you an adu as an adult without mm -hmm. any artistic talent uh, like myself, that would still be an opportunity you to exactly. like you know color along mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I like that. So I can convert a lot of these images into line drawings that can then be colored in. And uh, I should yeah. I should not be joking about uh, coloring books. There's actually mm -hmm. a lot of people that uh, adults as well that use that as you know a way to relax and uh, totally. just do something that doesn't Absolutely. take as much energy. Absolutely, it's it's a wonderful activity, um, very uh, um, meditational, uh, very 
relaxing, as you say. I agree. It is. I'm, I'm watching you paint on one, two, three, four cameras, and <laughs> I'm, I'm really relaxed. So that's definitely working on me. Well, there's a reason why shows like Bob Ross's, uh, uh, was it The Love of Painting? It, it Was it? Was it I that, think so, that yes. That, that were so popular. Um, people love to, myself included, I love to watch people paint. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it's fun both from an educational standpoint, you know, learning how to do it, but also just to see something take form. I enjoy that. And so, and, and then it's fun when you have that. I'm just going to put this comment on again because I, mm -hmm. I find that so interesting. Totally serious. So uh, you were not kidding then after all. Uh, I'm still weak with proportions, so I often use coloring sheets to practice shading and contours uh, without having to worry about that. So that's Excellent. actually a really yep. valid point. Yep, absolutely. I agree. Uh, it, it's a wonderful way to learn about getting proportions as well, to master them. When you have them in front of you and you're blocking in the color, you, you learn about how, you know, you're, 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 hands work around those proportions and you get sort of a feel of them and, and you're observing them that this is basically what we do as artists we're we observe things and and learn about their shape and the way that that different animals are posed depending on what they're doing and and that's how i assimilate all this information to try to portray them in their natural environment in what looks like a natural sort of an activity so yeah coloring is a wonderful way to learn about proportions for example and I just agree. look at this image this is so pretty thank you <laughs> so here we go we're getting very close i mean at this point it's kind of like you know i'm just kind of adding details here and there but you know you could pretty much call it effectively finished um because we're really kind of getting to that point where there's a lot a lot of it following this would just be detail one other thing i should point out is actually as we go toward the further distance because we're getting, uh, we're seeing the the uh, ocean at a at a lower and lower angle. Basically, you get more uh, reflected light from the sky, and so you get actually a little bit more brightness happening in some of the reflections of the waves. So that's one thing I'll I'll do is add some more of these reflected light to the top as we go into the distance. Not a lot more detail, but it is more realistic. And the further back you go, the smaller the waves look. So that actually adds a level of um, depth as well by conveying the, the re, you know, receding size of objects uh, or, or smaller size of objects, apparent size as they recede into the distance, right? So that's another thing that can help us to sort of um, convey a sense of depth. I'm going to pass on one last question from mm -hmm. uh, a viewer. A chaotic kitten wants to know, uh, do you have any tips or tricks to improve finger dexterity to oh, improve your, your artistic abilities? Good. That's a good question. I mean, I, I, for me, the best is really just to do more artwork if you can, because that's going to train your fingers to make the right kinds of movements. Um, I don't do any kinds of exercises to increase it. Um, one thing that is worth noting, though, is that depending on what you do, if you do too much of certain kinds of movements, you can um, develop a bit of soreness sometimes. And it could be sometimes either joint pain or, or muscle uh, strain or whatever. So be careful with that. And you want to increase the diversity of movements as much as you can. Stretch as much as you can as well. Stretching is good. Uh, and um, some of us, I myself included, have... Uh, notice that sometimes our our bones and our wrists for example can can be configured in a really weird way so you have these phenomena called subluxation of some of the uh, bones and so they don't quite sit properly with respect to each other and you can get these little shock sensations sometimes that are enhanced by overuse uh, and so you know it, it, some of the bones get a little bit looser in their connections and such so, so some people have I'm sure have experienced that a lot as well unfortunately these are all kind of things that we kind of have to deal with and there are certain techniques that help to minimize uh, some of these effects as well so I've sometimes used a wrist brace uh, that I wear at night. I've tried to wear it while working too. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, but that can be a pretty major concern as well for some people. And well, watch out with tendonitis. <laughs> Just be careful with that. <laughs> so we're adding those 
those last details mm -hmm. i find fascinating uh, the the length of the program really has allowed us to uh, to always show yeah. people pretty much the entire thing from start yeah. to finish you yeah, didn't exactly. put any actual uh any actual pigment on that sheet of paper until the program started so you were yeah. able to watch this from beginning to the end exactly the only thing i had is i'd kind of outlined where i wanted the animals and their overall shape because you know i don't want to be doing a lot of erasing and such and when it comes to pastels you can't easily erase them um, you can add more of a color that's similar to the background that's pretty much all you can do they don't erase too well they do rub off a little bit but once you work them into the paper it's harder to get them off so you kind of want to know where they're where you're putting them. it's good exercise because it's really nice way for you to become more confident in your uh, strokes so that you know you put pigment where you intend to do it and not stray marks as much as possible so you don't have to go back and repair things. That helps. Good practice. That's also similar with pen and ink. If you're working with pen and ink, you learn pretty quickly how to be efficient and, uh, and very deliberate with your strokes so that you don't get a lot of straight marks because as you know, it's very difficult to pull a pigment, like um, ink off a surface, right? Depending on the surface. Right. There was there, There's a question. Is the paper itself blue or prepped with mm. paint? No, it's actually blue. It's fully blue all the way through. So this is just a, a blue colored um, pastel paper, Canson in this case. So there's a bit of tooth to it, which actually helps to hold some of the pastel itself uh, between the fibers of the paper and the surface uh, and between the little divots uh, and ridges of the paper. Uh, so that helps. Uh, I talked earlier about velour paper, which is textured like velvet, and it's got these little vertical fibers coming off the surface. Really wonderful for soft pastels like Schminky. I love using velour paper, and I actually tried to get some for this program, but couldn't find any in, the, in my favorite art shop, so I'm going to go back later and check it. And if I do find it, I'll bring it for another episode, because I kind of really want to show that one as well. It's just fun to work with. It just feels nice to work with it. It's one of the fascinating things about this program too that you get to uh, like see all these different media that that yeah. you're working with. Because last yeah. last week, oh sorry, last month we had mm -hmm. uh, we had you paint. Uh, sorry, we had pencils. you draw yeah. with yeah with color pencils yeah. on yeah. black paper, yeah, which was exactly. so fascinating to watch. So yeah, if that, you guys, fun. Mm -hmm. if you guys want to check out that that first episode about killer whales or yeah. orcas, yeah. then you absolutely should because. Um, yeah, you were you were you were drawing that with color pencils on completely black. Yeah, paper. I love using that medium uh, combination, and especially just working on on a dark medium with lighter pigments. I really enjoy that. It's just somehow really satisfying. To the other thing that I want to bring onto the show at one point is um, scratchboard. That's another form of the same sort of uh, um, uh, process, basically uh, light on dark. So it's basically just a a wooden board uh, that is co coated in the kaolinite clay, which is white. And then on top of that is a layer of India ink. And so it becomes overall black. And then you use a sharp instrument like an X-Acto knife or a pin or whatever to scratch off the layer of black paint, revealing the white clay underneath. And you get, because it really depends on what instrument you use, you can get extraordinarily thin lines. So it's really good for depicting fur, for example, because you can get a lot of fine little lines of fur, but it also means that you can get pretty lost in a lot of details. But it's a very, very satisfying medium to use. And I'd like to kind of bring that in there as well at one point. Well, I look forward to that. I should mention uh, we've already <laughs> we've already exceeded our ad oh, time okay. today. Well, there we uh, go. So <laughs> our, our team our team consists not just of Julius and myself. We have uh, Christine working yes. behind the scenes. Uh, one of her jobs is to keep us on track with the time because both Julius and I, once we start talking, I think we could just <laughs> keep going and we wouldn't realize at some True. point the sun sets and uh, True. that's it. Yeah. But uh, do you do you want to point out a few last uh, things? Mm -hmm. um, let's go with this view, I think, because okay. it's the sharpest well, view. There we go. So yeah, I'd say that's pretty close to where we want it to be. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got the two porpoises, one underwater, one halfway through the surface of the water. I'm adding just a few more lines down here to highlight some of the, the sunbeams intersecting some you know, whatever small particles in the water, scattering the light and making it visible as beams, which is really what happens when you have like light 
um, coming through like from your curtains and there's dust in the air and you can see the beams of light. Uh, and that's because it's, um, it's highlighting, it's, it's reflecting off and scattered by the dust particles in the air. Uh, that's how you can see those. The same way as like when there's smoke in the air, you can see sunbeams or mist in the air. That's because light is either scattered by or reflected by the um, particles making up that vapor or, or sort of particle suspension of smoke or, or, or um, gas or like a, a vapor basically, like if it's water. Yeah. Um, and there we go. So we have the uh, two Dallas Porpoise, and um, uh, I guess all that's left now is I'll just add my signature, and then we'll call this one finished, basically. Um, and so that was a, a fun one to do, because we got to see color this time, unlike last time when we worked in just black and white. Um, so that was, I always love working with color. And of course, uh, I, I very frequently, if I'm working on, on traditional media, I work with acrylics, which Yet another great way to get color, also because acrylics are quite forgiving in that you can paint over bits that you don't like. Well, um, as Bob Ross used to say, there, yeah. are, there are no <laughs> there mistakes. Go. That's it. You can do anything you want with acrylics, basically, that way. And they're fast drying, too, so you really don't have to wait long before you can transport it. Uh, with dry pastels, as their name suggests, they're dry right away. They're not oil-based, or they're not oily like oil pastels. Um, I'll want to wash my hands afterwards. Technically, I should be wearing gloves because some of these have components that aren't really healthy to come in contact with skin. So please do use a glove uh, or some way to have, you know put something between your skin and, and the, the, the pastel. Don't do as I do, <laughs> do, do as I do, say. Do we need to this time and I don't try this at home? <laughs> <laughs> or try it differently at home. But um, since I, I very, very, very rarely work this way, uh, I kind of let it slide this time. But again, yeah, it's better to be safe with these. And yeah, these pan pastels are really great to work with. You can use paint brushes as well. But um, some of these applicators that I've been using are quite effective for making very smooth uh, gradients and also because you can add a little bit more pressure with them than you can with paint brushes so you can experiment with whatever works though i'm so fascinated with the result i'm just going to show that from from this angle against my yeah, favorite camera because it's there got the, go. the the sharpest Full image thing. move that away a bit so you can see it there you go honestly just because of the the uh that you know you said it has a little bit of a like tooth, a little bit of a texture mm -hmm. on there. I, I was really thinking this would look very smooth, but it actually does yep. uh, smoother than you would think. Yeah, it's actually quite a fine textured paper. Uh, there's some, there's actually some interesting variation. There's, there's also some pastel paper that is like sandpaper. It's, it's actually textured like sandpaper. And if you run your hand over it, it's, it's like fine sandpaper. And those those kinds of paper have a very different way of interacting with uh, with pastels as well. They really eat pastels for <laughs> breakfast, though, because so you go through pastels very quickly if you use sandpaper, um, sandpaper paper, <laughs> sandpaper, <laughs> basically. Uh, so you kind of want to keep in mind, um, you know, how uh, how you want it to look and how much of the pastel you're applying. Um, it will be, I think, a more a richer more filled in uh, color on that kind of paper than you will on these ones with a more sort of longer wavelength tooth. Well, we've we've reached the end of this program and I, I have to thank our, our viewers yes. for the interesting comments. Uh, I, I was following the conversation. I didn't put every question on screen, but there was quite a bit of discussion going on about technique and uh, about physics in between. Now uh, there's a conversation going on about uh, different kinds of gloves and yeah, which that materials. Yeah, I saw that too. That's actually a good point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whichever protective gear you wish to use. Right. But, and also trying to think um, uh, sustainably because it's true that some types of gloves don't break down well in landfills. So if you can use reusable gloves, let's say you have your own cloth gloves um, as uh, 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 one of our uh, Bill McD, I think, has suggested. Yeah. That's a good idea. If you can use reusable gloves, please do because the last thing we want is to generate more waste. And being near the ocean here, some of that waste is going to unfortunately get ingested by Dow's porpoise. Uh, as they're trying to eat whatever foods they're eating, or sea turtles. Uh, as a depressingly large proportion 
of the gut contents of sea turtles and many cetaceans is plastic waste these days, more and more so. Um, and a very large proportion of those that ingest plastic waste either suffer from it or die. Uh, so we have to be super careful. Uh, when I'm shopping, I try my best to actually not buy things wrapped in plastic as much as I can. In many cases, I simply won't buy a product that I might otherwise want, but that is not available in any other way except wrapped in plastic. I don't have to have it. If I don't have to have it, then it's better for me to just say, you know what, I'm not gonna buy it because even though we have a decent recycling program in BC, most places don't. Uh, and we don't want to be encouraging more production of plastic by using it up and buying it, right? Um, to me, that just makes sense. Yeah, I was just thinking I have vinyl gloves, basically also plastic, but at least they're reusable That's, and they're going to they're gonna last. Go. Yep. They've already lasted for 10 years. They're makes probably going to last for another 10 years. It makes a huge difference. If you can reuse it, then yeah, that's going to be uh, a whole lot better. Okay, well, with that, I want to thank Julius, our resident artist. Thanks so much for coming uh, into our little studio here again. On behalf of the Purpose Conservation Society, myself, uh, Christine in the background, uh, I'd like to thank you, all of our viewers, uh, for watching. I want to thank, uh, of course, our moderators as well, especially on the Marine Mammal uh, Rescue Channel, which have been uh, guiding the conversation a little bit and... Uh, uh, making sure that we all don't descend into chaos, which <laughs> undoubtedly otherwise uh, would definitely happen. Um, and with that, we're going to oh, be off. One, one more thing. One other thing I should mention, since there's stuff coming up, um, I do a how to draw webinars with a whole bunch of organizations as well. Uh, and there's one coming up pretty soon, actually. I work a lot with Sierra Club BC as well. We do a lot of sort of terrestrial-based stuff. Uh, mostly like forest organisms. So we have one of those coming up. If you um, log on to their website and Sierra Club BC, you'll see one of those coming up soon. Um, and uh, so we do this semi-regularly. And so I do work with Sharks for Kids and other ones as well, where we do various kinds of fun activities, coloring sheets, paint by numbers, uh, how to draw webinars, all sorts of things, little models and such. There's a lot of really neat stuff on, on, on the web for this kind of stuff. I, and I and a bunch of other artists have contributed to some of these. And so we're doing it here and in other places as well. We're basically trying to be as actively involved in as many of these organizations as possible. So uh, basically, if you just copy and paste Julius's full name from the uh, stream's description, no matter where you're watching from right now, then uh, you'll definitely going to find all yep. these uh, events as well. Yep. Okay, with that, again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we'll see you in November. We don't have an exact date yet, nor yep. do we know what we're going to be yep. <laughs> doing, but it's going to be just as exciting as uh, today's event. And I'm actually going to leave you with an impression of the final painting and uh, we'll see you all in next November uh, in November make sure you tune in for that have a good night everyone bye bye good night